all your channels. We ran out of talking now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is for just the people that are trying is to listen in we right did. now. It's, it's, I'll, I'll say here, I won't mention, uh, we did have Billy Cox uh, uh, had engagement tonight and so did Stephen Greer. They were invited. I thought they might come. And I'm pretty disappointed that uh, Giuliano uh, was not able to, but he's put that article out because he's one of the key guys, I think, that hasn't gotten any sort of respect in this story. I mean, this guy was the the guy, sort of like the, like the Googles um, for this whole thing in terms of knowing where to go and getting information and stuff. So I'm, I'm sorry that he's not on. But anyway, um, we're going to go. And as I said, Melinda will come in later. And I'll just we're just going to go through the things. So we're going to start with Richard. Um, I'll just sort of introduce everybody and then we'll sort of go to Richard first and we'll start back in uh, 2008 and we'll just sort of go through the chronological order of how things happened and um, once that's done we'll open it up for questions. Are you asking me to start right now Grant is that what I'm understanding? Yeah do you want you want to introduce the people? <laughs> <laughs> I think I can introduce everyone here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks. And I, I'm hoping that we'll be able to run this really well. And uh, look, this for the last uh, 13 months now, this has been a subject that has really rocked the UFO world. This is a very, very important development that we're here talking about, the so-called Wilson Davis notes. We're going to get into all of that. I, I personally, and I think everyone here probably agrees that this is one of the most important uh, developments in our field in a while. I called it the, leak, the UFO leak of the century. Um, I stand by that. So there's a lot of people who are here who are part of this story who've got something unique to tell. Uh, there's, there's Grant Cameron. Thanks, Grant, for hosting this. Um, there's myself. Grant has uh, foolishly asked me to be a co-host, so I've, and I have foolishly accepted, so we're doing that. Um, James Rigney, I'm seeing uh, James up there from Australia. James is one of the early, um, earliest people to get a copy of the full notes by Dr. Eric Davis after the passing of astronaut Edgar Mitchell and James can talk about that. We have attorney Michael Hall, uh, who's also one of the early people to get access to this via grant and Michael can talk about his involvement. I see Joe Mergia, who is uh, one of the young guns. Grant dubbed you guys that and I think that's a great name. Joe has a great blog site, UFO Joe. Um, Joe and I had an interview recently and Joe's got a lot of great investigative uh, journalism on this development. There's uh, Bob McGuire. Bob is uh, an executive and uh, with a background in government service who has his own angle on the Wilson side of this leak going back more than 15 years. And I think we're very much interested in uh, that. There's Jay, gosh, Jay, I can't remember your last name over Project Unity. He doesn't use it. He doesn't use it. Well, there we go. <laughs> Project Unity. That's why. Project Unity is a great YouTube channel. And uh, Jay has been deeply involved in a lot of the investigation for this. And I just want to uh, give a shout out to Jay's anonymous uh, interviewee, Mr. X, who happens to be a friend of mine. I'll just put that out there. And uh, someone that I think gave one of the best analyses of the uh, Wilson Davis notes that are out there, period. Uh, Danny Silva, with the great record collection behind him, um, who runs the Silver Record, another uh, outstanding website with a lot of current information on this subject. And uh, Desta Barnaby is hanging out here with us. She is running, she is Grant's assistant and running um, this behind the scenes. And is there anyone I'm leaving out here? Michael Hall. Well, yeah, I, we did Michael. But I mentioned Michael. So we are expecting Melinda Leslie who is another researcher who's kind of deep involved in a lot of this. And um, I, I know that she's got a connection with Jim Sammy Van and she probably has got some interesting things to say about this as well. So anything else I'm missing, Grant, before I jump nope, in? Nope, that's it. And we'll start with you because we wanted to do this chronologically. Yeah. And for a lot of the people, they just got religious about this story in the last uh, 13 months. Uh, this story has been going on 13 years. You were involved, I was involved. Billy Cox, you and Billy Cox, and uh, Julia, uh, Giuliano were really involved in this. And that's what people I think have to realize is 
you actually saw part of this document back then. So let's yes. go through the, your story of, of how this thing starts back many, many years ago. Absolutely. Uh, back in 2006, I was uh, in communication with someone very, very, very close to the Wilson Davis scenario, the, someone very close to Dr. Eric Davis. I have promised ever since never to reveal this person's name. I have kept that promise. I think smart people can perhaps figure out who this might have been, but I will never give this person's identity up while they are alive. And, um, but it was someone that I respect and someone that I'd had and have had conversations with throughout for many, many years. Um, and in late 2006, I was shown two, I actually wondered if it's two or three, but I think it's two pages of what turned out to be these notes. And this will just give me the, a very quick opportunity to describe the whole scenario so that people jumping in know what the heck we're talking about. Um, this was introduced to me by this individual who said, we have, we, a group of people have been looking into something that happened with a, a former high level government official back in the, uh, during the Bill Clinton administration. And in fact, he told me it was 1997 in which this individual was, uh, had attempted to go behind the scenes to gain access or at least uh, gain information about a deep black budget special access program to study alien technology, basically, and how this person was denied access to that program. And that this person who was a very high level government official, and I, at the time I wasn't even told what his position was, uh, but someone who believed he should have had access to it had knocked on a few doors, two months later found, this is how it was told to me, found what he was looking for and was denied access. And in fact, I was told even then in 2006 that this individual was denied access primarily by the corporate attorney of the program. Uh, we didn't get into the security manager and the uh, program manager, but I was told he was denied access by the corporate attorney who said, you don't have a need to know. Um, and that what I was reading was a snippet of an interview with that individual by another person who uh, had gotten the chance to interview him. And the part that I read specifically that I had never forgotten was where this government official said, uh, yeah, I learned, I understood that this technology was not made by man and not by human hands. And um, so that was very powerful to me. And I was not allowed to photograph the document. I was not allowed to write any of it down in front of him. Um, I promised that I would use this really for my own personal uh, research. Shortly after that, I learned about Dr. Stephen Greer's book, Hidden Truth, Forbidden Knowledge, which came out in, I think it was 2006, around the same time. And I saw that Greer had actually referred to this, this meeting and had outed Admiral Thomas Wilson by name. I wrote back to my contact who had showed me the documents. I said, oh, so this is Wilson, I assume. He says, yes, it's Wilson. Um, in the immediate aftermath of that, I thought, well, let me write to uh, Edgar Mitchell, who was also part of the original 1997 meeting, um, along with Stephen Greer. I wrote to Mitchell. He confirmed that the meeting had happened. Mitchell, even then, I will just say, did not really want to explore this any further than that. Um, I don't know why specifically, but he was very, very uh, curt. And we were on good terms, but he did not want to explore this at that time with me. And then I, uh, I found out where Thomas Wilson was working, a company called ATK Technologies. I think that's what it was. And um, aerospace, basically defense contractor, <coughs> pardon me. And I found Wilson. As I've often said, it was the one time in my life that I did a genuine ambush interview on someone and I felt bad. Uh, Thomas Wilson, if you're listening, I really never meant to set you up. But what I did was I uh, told him that I was doing research on the United States Navy, uh, him being an admiral. I, I'd, I actually had found an interview that he had given and I was able to comment on it. And he agreed to do the interview with me. As soon as I got him on the phone, um, he sounded very friendly, very cordial, actually, and I could actually hear him easing into a nice, big, comfy chair, getting ready for a, a nice interview. 
uh, I very quickly told him that I was doing research on the UFO phenomenon and that I had learned about him having a meeting back in 1997 on the subject of UFOs. And he immediately denied any knowledge of that meeting. He immediately said, uh, I had no memory of doing a UFO meeting. I said, sir, I know for a fact that you were there. Astronaut Edgar Mitchell informed me of this and another scientist of very high caliber has informed me of this. I know you were there. Uh, he then said, oh yes, well, my memory is foggy on this. Uh, I remember it was a UFO thing. I had no interest in UFOs, he said to me. The only reason I agreed to it was because someone of Dr. Mitchell's stature, Apollo astronaut, was interested and I wanted to know why. That's exactly what he said to me. Um, then I told him that Stephen Greer's book had mentioned that in the aftermath of this 1997 meeting that he had tried and failed to get access to the black budget programs dealing with ET tech. And Wilson just said that was all poppycock. He said, the meeting happened, everything else is poppycock. His voice got very high pitched, got very clearly anxious and upset. And he ended the phone call almost immediately. He said he had a meeting. So that was my brief encounter with Admiral Wilson back at the time. And uh, over the years from 06 onward, I would give lectures at various UFO conferences and I would talk about this. Um, I'm sure people can find references to it. I, I didn't hide it at all, but I wasn't able to have any proof of it. I didn't have the snippet with me. I didn't have an interview with me. Uh, I had no transcript. So that's really where it was. And then, uh, and I'll just jump ahead very quickly and let other people take over. It wasn't until 2019 that uh, I was sent through a anonymous Proton Mail uh, account a link to the Imgur page where the full 15 pages of these notes were there. And, you know, in the subsequent years, I mean, I learned a lot of things about those notes. I learned that uh, Admiral Wilson's position was uh, Deputy Chief of Intelligence of the Joint Chiefs and a lot of other things. And I knew that, learned that the author of those notes was Dr. Eric Davis, but I'd never read them. And um, as soon as I saw that link, which by the way, I almost missed, my wife Tracy found that link Thank you, Tracy. Um, but as soon as I saw it, I immediately knew this is exactly what I was shown uh, 13 years earlier. And I, I knew along with Grant, because we talked about it pretty quickly, that this was, uh, this was a big, big thing. In fact, one last thing that I'll just mention is after I had my phone call with Admiral Wilson, which also took place in late 2006, I wrote back to my source who had shown me the document to begin with. And I said, uh, yeah, Wilson just denied the whole thing. And, and my, my source said, well, what would you expect? Uh, this would be enough to just bring his whole house of cards down and a lot, a lot down with it, uh, an admission like that. I mean, first of all, it's an admission that the UFO phenomenon is real. And in 2006, that was still a huge deal. And it was also an admission that significant portions of the US government, responsible portions of the US government were locked out of that program, or at least it, it seemed like that in favor of private contractors. And that's, that was the whole reason Greer uh, was making the rounds in DC, at least as far as I can understand, is to point out that these were essentially rogue programs, not run by, uh, not properly run by US government people. So that's essentially it. Uh, there's a lot more that, that comes, um, it came to me in the aftermath of that, but essentially my interaction with this document started in 2006. And I've um, never had a reason to doubt it ever since. These documents, these notes have existed for a long, long time. I'll say one more thing. And I, and I, I know I've been talking too long here, but in the aftermath of this document coming out, as many will remember, it was released along with the, uh, the infamous alien autopsy email thread. And we're not really here to talk about that. And there's a lot of opinions about that. That really focused on Dr. Kit Green primarily. And I interviewed Kit Green in July of 2019. And at the end of my interview on that, I, I asked Kit if he knew about the Eric Davis notes on Admiral Wilson. And Kit Green gave me a, an on the record and an off the record answer. His on the record answer was a, a very detailed statement, and I'm only paraphrasing here, but pretty accurately said, look, the fact that I've seen this document, the fact that I know it exists, the fact that I have an opinion about it uh, is irrelevant. 
because I'm not in a position to uh, essentially to source the, the um, authenticity or the identity of the document. He then gave me an off the record statement, which lasted for about 20 minutes. And at the end of that off the record statement, I'll, I'll simply say my opinion about the authenticity of that document has not changed one iota. Uh, I'm allowed to mention that Kit Green gave me an off the record statement. I just, um, as a professional courtesy, I'm not saying what it was because he asked me not to. So there's a lot going on here. What you find is the closer you get to the source of all of these notes, it's very obvious that the notes are authentic, that Eric Davis, on behalf of what I often call the Bigelow crowd, that is Hal Puthoff, Colm Kelleher, Bigelow himself, Kit Green, went and met with Admiral Wilson in 2002 and basically hit a home run of an interview with Wilson and got a huge amount of information from him that was originally only expected to circulate among that little crowd. And the only reason it came out is because Edgar Mitchell, who was part of that crowd, died and his notes got out. That's it. That's why we have it. All right. Thanks, everyone, for letting me go on as long as I did. And I'll pass was, the torch to the next person. Well, that was good. I, I just want to maybe a little follow-up question because James Ian Dolly isn't here. Uh, there was um, discussion and Giuliano actually brought out an article today about this two, 1995 letter. And I didn't realize there that Greer, he gives this lecture in, I think it was 2015, a four-hour seminar, and he talks about it, that it seems to indicate that Wilson went twice, that this 95 letter went from Greer to Wilson. Wilson discovered he had been had, and then he made the phone call and got hung up on, and they blocked his line. And then after the briefing, that's when he makes the trip and makes a second effort to try to get to the 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 uh, bottom of the thing. Is that your understanding that there there may have been two actual attempts by Wilson to get to the bottom of this? Are you asking me this? Yes, Dan? yes, yes. Uh, my well, the 1995 letter is uh, was written by Will Miller, who we haven't mentioned yet, who's a very very key part of this. In fact, from what it, it's come to me, and Joe Merger has got a lot to say on this, I think. Uh, I think Will Miller was really the driving force of these meetings, or at least you can argue yeah. that he was even more than Stephen Greer. I'm not taking anything away from Stephen Greer on this, by the way. He was very important for this. But Will Miller had a connection with Admiral Wilson, and it's very obvious from that 1995 letter that James Ian Dolly found on Greer's website. And so, yeah, it's obvious that these conversations had been taking place for at least two years before the 1997 meeting. And it's very significant, um, probably Joe could talk about this, that here's Miller talking, writing to Wilson about UFOs, about Roswell, about Phil Corso Jr., about Stephen Greer. This is a very heavily UFO oriented letter. So that when Thomas Wilson says that he had no interest in UFOs, that is clearly not true. And I'm not accusing of being a liar. He's just got to say what he's got to say. But the evidence is crystal clear that Will Miller was have, had a relationship with Wilson, was in communication with Wilson, and they were talking about UFOs and they was referencing a previous conversation that the two had. So this is obviously something that was important to Will Miller. It became, or it was important to Stephen Greer. I don't know the mechanics of how those two made the decision to go to Washington and who to talk to. And then they brought Edgar Mitchell and, and a number of other people along as well. But it's very interesting. And I think that letter, it's a really important find by James. And th that's just more evidence to show that Thomas Wilson, understandably, but is still really not being honest fully about, about what's been going on here. Yeah. Well, that was shown today with this lecture that I saw that Stephen talked quite a bit about that 95 letter and they actually showed mm -hmm. it in a in a lecture. But as a segue Good. to our next guest here, James mm -hmm. Rigney, uh, something I always point out when I tell your story, part of the story is that uh, James Fomey at one point, I got the, the documents in November of um, 2018 and we had a problem that James really didn't want to send him by email. So we set up Proton accounts. It was actually Desta set up the accounts. And that's when James moved the documents to me. And about the same time you went on the Jimmy Church show, and I always point out to people, you got to listen to this interview that Richard did on, because this is six months before you go public with the documents, where James phones me up and he says, did you give the documents to Dolan? I said, no, I didn't give to Dolan. He said, well, he's on Jimmy Church. He's talking about the document. I said, no, he can't be. And I'm thinking, well, maybe I did give him to Dolan. I'm thinking, like, he's got me all confused. So he said he's, and so I went and I listened. And this is, I think it's 
December the 18th or 19th, 2018. Mm-hmm. So this is right after I get the documents. You're on Jimmy Church and you tell the story about being shown. Jimmy Church asks you the question. He says, mm-hmm. did you ever see a document that you sort of like uh, wish you had had, you could have seen, all this kind of stuff? And you start describing the, the, the document. I'm going, he is talking about the, he's talking about the document. So then uh, later on, we sort of uh, figured out that you know, when you told the story, you'd seen two pages of the document, but we were having this discussion. I always point out to people, this is extremely important to remember that Richard was on six months before and actually talked about the fact that he had seen this document. So this wasn't something you made up after you, you saw the whole thing. And, and to point out, Desta had a big part of this because she was sort of a, a interacting with you. You know, at first I didn't want to talk to you. I was, I was still sort of, um, uh, you know, upset about what it was going to do with this whole thing. And uh, Desta did a lot in terms of talking to James and James, open your mic and let's get your um, your version of the story. This is one of the first times you've ever talked about this, right? You approached me uh, in Laughlin, Nevada. You got uh, this sort of vision in the middle of the night, uh, but you had actually contacted other researchers before me, correct? I wasn't sort of the first one. I, I was the first one that you actually gave the documents to and you came to me that morning And uh, as you always said, if I had left 10 minutes earlier, uh, my life would have been different, which was true. I really didn't want to talk to you. I really wasn't interested. You had him on an iPad at that point. So tell me the story of your involvement in this uh, story and how it unraveled for you. Okay, Doug. Well, basically, I, for a number of years, not so much now, because I'm just so far down the UFO rabbit hole, of course, but maybe for a decade or so, I was fairly heavily invested in the aerospace industry. And fairly obsessed with that. And I would make trips maybe once a year to to the US to attend various conferences and various uh, events that NASA would put on, rocket launches, et cetera. So there's one particular conference that I attended four or five times and I got to know one particular gentleman. Um, And he's in fact the guy who later, you know, was a source of the documents. Now we developed quite a good friendship and we would, when I was back, because I'm from Melbourne, Australia, when I was back in Australia, he'd ring from time to time or I'd call him. And this, this relationship went on for, for several years. And it turned out that this particular gentleman was quite close to Edgar Mitchell. And that, that was good for me too. It gave me the opportunity on a number of occasions to, um, to meet Dr. Mitchell and one occasion spend a bit of time with him and have a personal chat. And that, that was just incredible. Um, so uh, yeah, that, was all very, that was all very based around the, the space side of things. Um, now, Dr. Mitchell died back in February 16, I think, Richard, wasn't it? Um, and this gentleman was, was invited by the family to, you know, to get involved with the funeral and various other things that were going on and help deal with um, his estate. Um, so, that, you know, I knew that had happened, but it, it, was, it was some weeks after that. Um, he called me one night and he, he said... Um, have you ever, and I won't mention names, but have you ever heard of so and so? And I said, well, yes. And it's a it's a lady who's um, well, very very well known in the um, UFO um, area. Uh, and I said, why do you ask? And he said, oh, I'm going through some of Edgar's uh, Edgar's papers, and uh, uh, so this is reference to this UFO lady. And uh, um, that was quite uh, harmless in itself. And it, but it made me ask. I said, so what else have you got? I said, what what's in these papers? Um, now, uh, there's a bit of a background there, which is a discussion itself as to how this gentleman got to have access to these papers, but maybe I'll, I'll go through my timeline first. Um, so I said to him, so what else have you got? Is there any other references to, to UFO people or UFOs? And he said, yeah, quite a few. And I said, and, and let's get one thing straight. This guy is not in the slightest bit interested in the UFO area. He's just not, he doesn't know anyone on this panel, etc." cetera. Um, I said, I've got to see these things. I said, what have you got? And he said, oh, there's lots of things. And I said, can I get access to them? Would you let me see them? And he goes, yeah, sure. You know? So it took some time, but I eventually organised a trip where I, was, I visited him at his place and had the opportunity to go through these documents. Um, I, in fact, this happened twice because he, he didn't have all the documents in one go. He actually got access to them over, over a period of time. And so I, I did this twice. Um, and... So I didn't have a lot of time, but I would go through these documents and I literally had 20 minutes to go through, you know, a, a whole number of documents. I thought, this one looks good, this one doesn't, this one looks good. 
So I just pulled a few of them aside and he, I said, can I copy these? He said, sure thing, no, no problem. So the next day I went off and made copies and, um, and brought them home with me. Now the same, he came across another pile of documents later and I did the same thing again. So um, it was only when I got back to Australia that I went through all these documents and read them. And, um, you know, that, that's why Grant was, when you were involved in this early on, Grant, you were, you were of the opinion that there were, there were a whole lot of documents. But in reality, uh, most of those documents weren't anything of great interest. Some were just personal things for Dr. Mitchell. Um, some, it turns out, were interesting, but already on the internet. But uh, sure enough, there was this Edgar Mitchell, the, this uh, Admiral Wilson document and the AA document in there. So um, I thought, okay, so what do I do with this? Uh, now, you've got to remember, when I first looked at this, this was quite a mystery. I didn't know who all these people were. You know, we all know who, who all these characters are. Are now, but at the time, it was like, who's this? So it was quite a period for me to start trying to unpack that document, to start looking up some of these names. Uh, and even then, it was it was it's quite a cryptic and, and confusing document. So I basically sat on this thing. You know, I would pull it out occasionally and uh, do a little bit of research and look up a few names and find out a bit a bit more about Admiral Wilson. I've got to say, when I when I saw the uh, alien autopsy document, I kind of went, oh no, here we go. <laughs> and, and I, in fact, Grant will tell you that I. I didn't give him that until quite a few months later, correct, Grant? Yeah, you didn't, you didn't even want me to put it out there. Well, you know, look, yeah. it's, 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 there's a lot to that. We all know there's a lot to that. There's a lot more to yeah. that story, and, and that's, that's for another day. But I didn't want that contaminating the Wilson document. Yeah. I absolutely knew that, that that other document was red hot, and the last thing he wanted to do was, you know, draw some connection between those two because there was yeah. always going to be a, a big controversy yeah. around yeah. the yeah. autopsy thing, and it was. It just took off, and it's still going. So here I am. So I've got this document. So what do I do with it? Um, and I'd gone off in December 18 to Paula Harrison's conference and I hadn't given this document a second thought. By that stage, I'd had it for over 12 months. And you're a little bit incorrect, Grant, when you said that this came to me at three o'clock in the morning. I think you're getting two stories a little bit confused there. Uh, it, it occurred to me about nine o'clock the night on the last night of the conference. And I'd got to know Desta to just say hi to and have a coffee with and so on. She's great. And I said, Desta, I've, I've, I've got something I really want to talk to Grant about. I said, can you, can you get hold of him? And as you've talked about a few times, Grant, you were, you know, we're in different, there, there, there's two different towers in this particular casino and yeah. they're, they're two different time zones and you didn't have phone reception. And um, I actually asked Desta, I said, is there a chance you can uh, find Grant and we could um, have breakfast tomorrow? There's something I want to show him. Anyway, she, she was very good, but she, said, look, I just can't find him. You tend to disappear, Grant. You go off, you do interviews, and you just disappear. And so you just know where to be seen. And I would literally, um, no, and what had happened actually after that is that I, I contacted my wife, Vicky, in Australia, and I said, you've got to do something for me. I said, there are some documents in a folder in my cupboard. I said, I need you to get them out. I need you to get, it's 15 pages. I need you to photograph each page, because she, she didn't know how to scan things um, or use a scanner. Photograph each page, send me each page as a message. Um, and then, so I, I basically got 15 pages of, of, of messages. Uh, and it was three o'clock in the morning. That's the three o'clock thing, right? It was three o'clock in the morning before I'd actually managed to compile those into a document uh, and drop them onto my iPad. So I'd given up on the idea, you were nowhere to be seen. And I'd gone off, I'd had breakfast with Paula Harris and a couple of other people. Uh, it was about 10 to 11, walking back to my hotel room through the lobby and you were standing there with your suitcases. And that's, you've told that story many times. So it was purely a coincidence that I happened to be just walking through the lobby and you were there. Otherwise this, they'd still be, probably still be sitting, you know, in, in the cupboard somewhere. And you've told that story. I don't know if you, there's probably no need to go through that. Um, so you were very excited. You, you know, we, we corresponded for a couple of months after that. And you said, look, we've, we've got to do something. This is really important. We've got to do something with it. This is really important. Um, you were doing the book, the sequel to Managing Magic, and you were, you told me you were going to put those in the book and that's how you were going to drop these, possibly redacted. Uh, and then nothing happened. So you kind of disappeared for four, five, six months and you know, just absolutely nothing happened. And as you've told the story, and it's quite correct, you contacted me one day and you said, I need to Skype. This was May, May of 19. I need to talk to you. So we, we opened up Skype. I think Desta was there. And you said, just like you said, you said, I can't do this. I can't do this. You know, I can't do this. Um, and I said, okay, so, so now what? 
and you said we need to give, give this to a few people. I said, you said, let's just get it out there. If we just put it out there, it'll kind of take on a life of its own. And uh, so we talked about who who we might give it to, if you recall. And I suggested James Fox because I had um, I'd got to know James quite well. He'd been in Australia filming the, the movie that he's got coming out, The Phenomenon. Um, and also Erica Lukes, which I'll talk about. Um, and I actually wanted to give it to Lee Spiegel to drop. And Lee is actually a journalist. He worked for the Huffington Post. Um, this is all, I've never talked about this to anyone until now. Um, I thought he'd be, he's, he's pretty courageous. He's done some good stuff with the United Nations, whatever. So my plan was to give it to Lee Spiegel to drop and to give it to James Fox and Erica Lukes to um, just to have a copy of. And on your side of it, you said, well, you will give it to a few people. And after that, you know, it's whatever happens, happens. So I contacted Lee Spiegel and he kind of just brushed me off. He didn't want to know about it, which is kind of funny. Um, so he kind of came and went. At one stage, I considered giving it to Paul Dean. Um, James Fox, I sent him a copy and he contacted me and said, what am I meant to do with this? And I said, well, nothing, <laughs> just nothing, just, just have it. You just, and I will say, but I've spoken to both James and Erica in the last few days and both of them are quite happy to go on the record to um, talk about this. And in fact, Erica mentioned it on her show on Friday night. Um, so now the interesting thing about Erica, she was involved in this from day one. She, I'd been to see Erica in Salt Lake City, we'd become good friends. Um, she actually encouraged me to get these documents. She would ring me up and say, so when you, you've got to get these documents. So when are you going to get these, uh, you know, make that visit. And it wasn't easy. It wasn't just like, it was really hard. It took a long time to get over there and to get hold of this stuff. It was a lot, I could write a book about just getting these, getting hold of these documents. So, you know, no one knows this, but Erica was actually involved from the beginning and had a big part in encouraging me to, um, to get them. And when I finally got them, I said, Erica, I, I can't give you these. I said, these, I said, for your own sake, I'm not going to give you these. I said, I will give them to you at some point in time. But trust me, I just cannot do this. I can't. And she she kind of understood. So when the time came in the middle of May, when we finally um, decided to distribute the docs, I gave her a copy. And she's decided to, well, James was just too busy doing his film. So that, you know, he was, he, he was saying I was working 16, 18 hours a day. I was falling asleep on the floor. You know, that's James. And that's still going on. Uh, and it's not his thing anyway. And then, uh, and Erica has just chosen not to kind of go down that rabbit hole. So she's she's followed this closely from the beginning. She's got her own thing going now, as you probably all know, with the Skinwalker thing, and it's the same cast of characters. So she has a fairly um, vested interest in in the story from another angle. Um, so she's chosen to do nothing with it. Uh, and then, um, so I don't know what happened on your side of things, Grant, but within within days. Uh, the story was on Reddit and it all went public and you've talked about what happened after that. Yeah. So I'll, that's I'll, you, I'll sort yeah. of fill in your thing and maybe we can, you can keep going, but um, what, what happened with me when you sent the documents, you, you had the issue that you didn't want to send them through email and stuff. And that's why Desta set up the Proton. We explained Proton accounts and Desta set them up, how you could send them and nobody would know where they're coming from. And the problem I had, and I, I talked to the young guns, they uh, discovered this, uh, talked to me when it first came out, I think it was in April, uh, James Ian Dolly phoned me up and he said, you know that document you talked about in December? Um, I think it's on the internet. And I, I could just feel my heart, you know, sort of like I was gonna have a heart attack. And I said, really? I said, uh, like, how many pages is it? And he said, it's 15. And I go, yeah, that could be the document. And it was the, the um, situation where the young guns actually held the document too. They discovered, I think they can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was April, they had discovered it. And when they, the conversation came to me, I said, well, if you drop it, you're gonna be, you could be the most famous person in the world. But I knew they were talking to Eric Davis and I knew they were talking to these people. And I said, if you drop this thing, uh, you, uh, you're, they're not gonna to talk to you anymore. You, you're gonna cut off your source. And I, I think a lot of them will talk about this, that if you open your mouth, then your sources are cut off. People won't talk to you, which I've experienced. So that's why I had a hard time dropping it. That's why I brought Michael Hall in is because I knew these guys, I, I knew them. And that's why when I was having the discussion with you, I was saying, and Desta was saying, 
Uh, well, you should be the guy dropping them because you don't have any vested interest. You don't know these guys. It's like if the, if the document had to do with Pendolfi or somebody else, I would have dropped them like in five minutes. But because I had dealt with these guys for 20 years in, in you know, indirectly from time to time, I would have conversations. It was sort of like, you know, getting, a, you know, an inside source and then cutting his throat when it's all said and done. So that was the problem that I had in, in, in sort of putting the documents out and to, to, to explain to people where it came from. Um, I was contacted by a bunch of people. And when James Ian Dolly first came to me in December, he asked for a copy of the document because I had talked about it on John Greenwald's show. And I had talked on, on Dave Scott um, uh, show in Canada. And so people knew I had him. In fact, Ron Pendolfi had made inquiries. Uh, I got a, a, a call from one of Ron Pendolfi's friends. And he said, Ron says, you've got some documents. Can you tell me what you've got? Can I see them? And I said, well, you absolutely can't see them. Uh, but they they knew I had the documents, and um, so I um, said. Eventually, I, I couldn't figure out what to do. I brought in um, uh, Michael Hall, and then we were gonna. It, I was actually having coffee with Desta the other day. We had actually taken the documents and we taken out all the names on the document. And we were gonna do it that way, and I thought, oh, that's not gonna work either. Uh, you just get into this big scandal about why did you take this name out and stuff like that. So I was in this box and then I suddenly decided that what I would do is um, I, I couldn't exactly put it on the internet myself, but I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not, a, I'm not a, uh, a cover up guy. So I figured like, oh, okay, I'll just talk about the document and anybody who says, can I see a copy? I'll just say, oh, you want a copy? Yeah, and I'll just give them. And that's what happened. I got contacted by a guy and this is, I'm pretty sure where the, where the document went online. Um, I got a copy from a guy who was being uh, courted by a number of high level UFO people. He was about to go under a non-disclosure agreement. And um, I was talking to him not about any of this kind of stuff. He, he was saying, who's this, this organization, this person? Uh, can I trust these people? And he, had a, he was a big name guy and he had a friend of his who wasn't into UFOs, who was in the Pentagon. And um, so he, he's talking to me. And then I mentioned the fact that I had this document. And he said, well, what is it? Uh, and I explained it. And he said, well, why don't you drop it? And I said, well, I explained, you know, I know these guys are, you know, I'm having a hard time sleeping at night and I'm going to drop this thing. And he said, well, send it to me. So then I sent it to him. And then he said, well, I think you should drop it. And I said, no, I just can't. I can't. I can't do it. I mean, if it was people I didn't know, I would do it right away. And then he said, uh, OK, leave it with me. And I knew they had this friend in the Pentagon who was in DIA and who knew, uh, it told some stories about Elizondo and stuff like that, but this guy wasn't interested. And then he said, um, my friend in the Pentagon says, just put it on Reddit. So I said, okay, fine. And I never talked to him again about the document. He just phoned me one time from Chicago. He was in an elevator and um, he said, I think those, uh, I think those, those documents you showed me? And I said, yeah. So I think they're, I, th I think they're on the internet. I go, oh, I got it. so then they sat there and I think it was 15, what was it, 49 or 59 days. They sat there until Richard picked it. And I'll always give Richard credit that Richard put his career on the line to run with this story. I mean, I couldn't do it. The, the young guns uh, couldn't do it, but Richard uh, risked a lot to actually uh, phone up some people and get comments and say, okay, this is out. What do you say about this? And if it hadn't been for Richard, uh, this thing never would have gone. So I have not talked to this guy since, but I gave him both the documents. And um, then what happened in the end, you and I, Rich, uh, James, were having this conversation. And I kept saying to you, You've got, you've got no vested interest. You've got no ax to grind. You can drop these documents. And that's why I kept saying, let's give them to some people. And um, so the, the one that Richard got, I think, was from my source. He got desperate because he, he said, well, nobody's picking up on the document. They're sitting on the Internet. And at one point, you phoned me and I said, they're on the Internet. That's all I can do. I mean, they're on there. We've got to wait for someone to pick it up because they sat on the Internet for quite a while. And um, so my, um, w when the thing uh, took off, uh, my friend, basically, I never talked to him again. I know, don't know if he went under a non-disclosure agreement or whatever, uh, but I'm pretty sure I know who, who did it because uh, it fit the thing of putting it on Reddit. And they told me it's very easy to do. You can hide your, your name. And they told me about the Proton accounts and how to, how to do all this kind of stuff. So that's basically was my role. And um, when it came out, then Richard came to me. Uh, once he got a copy, I knew they were asking Desta, did Grant send this? And, I, and, and no, I said, 
Desta was saying, no, Grant didn't send it. She knew because she knew what was going on, who was who was dropping the document. It came from the same guy who put it on Reddit was the guy. He was starting to get desperate. So he sent a copy to Richard and Richard almost missed it. And he sent a copy to Jimmy Church tells the story. And but he sent a link and Jimmy Church wouldn't open the email because he figured it might be somebody trying to hack his account. So he didn't open the email. And Richard luckily opened the email when uh went with the story and it went viral. So that's basically how this document got out. Can I add one thing? I, I forgot to mention that the plan was to send it to Richard as well. Um, but, and I can't remember why, but we, I think I said, I'm gonna, I'm also gonna send it to Richard, but I'm gonna leave it for about a week. And I think that's because Grant, you wanted some time to digest it and work out a plan. I think you were gonna do a podcast or something. So about, about uh, a week later, I, I sent an email to Richard who, We'd met maybe, I don't know, five years earlier, but he didn't know me at all. Um, and I just, I think it said, oh, hello, Richard. I'd just like to talk to you about the, the Wilson documents. And within about a millisecond, I got this email back and he said, talk to me, you know. And I said, I've got some documents. And he said, I've already got them. And uh, so you, by that stage, again, we're talking mid-May, you'd already, someone else had sent them to you. And that's why you say, Richard, that... Um, uh, I, I said, I, you know, I was going to send them to you, and I was, but yeah. we wanted to put a few days in there because we knew that once you had them, that the whole thing was going to, you know, you, you'd go very big on this. Yeah, for the uh, record, yeah. Uh, the, re the reason I, I said not to send it to Richard, as I said, Richard's in the same boat I'm in. He's talking yes. to these guys. And that's why I said, we got to send it to somebody who doesn't, who's not vested in, in talking to these guys as sources. And I think that's why I said to you not to, not, not to, that I, and we were having discussion about who should we send it to? And we were having this, should it be this person? Should it be that person? Uh, and I think that was my reasoning was that Richard, because when Richard contacted me, he said, I need to talk to you. And I said, I don't want to talk. Uh, you're in the same boat I'm in. Have a good time, or something like that. It's like you know, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about it. And and then Richard went with it, and of course, it went immediately viral on the internet. And <clears throat> that's the story. So, you got any comment on that, Richard? Yeah, briefly. Um, and then we should let some other people jump yeah. in here. Um, I received that document in uh, sometime in April. I could double check the uh, email. So it actually was about a month and a half before I started talking about it. Um, and I still don't, <clears throat> pardon me, I still don't know the identity of the person who sent that to me. At least I'm not 100% sure. But yeah, everything what James said uh, is how I remember it and everything that you said pretty much is how I remember it. Um, I remember like you Grant, really agonizing for over a month thinking how, how do we get this out? Because I will just say I was uh, emotionally committed to that document getting out at some point and for me, at some point in 2019, my personal attitude was this is going to be publicized. And if I have to do it, I will do it. But I, like you, I did not want to do it. Absolutely, I did not want to. And uh, the reason I, I did, I should really review uh, my own emails, but it was evident that this was starting to break out because there was a, a email list that I was on where the, uh, the alien autopsy thread was being discussed. And I knew that that was all part of the same thing. And um, I just made an assumption that this whole thing was coming out. And I did want to make sure that I would do my best to get a, a coherent, uh, a coherent analysis and story about this document out first right away, because I thought it deserved that. And that's when I, I publicized it on my YouTube channel and wrote that's about it. Okay, let, let's go th then to uh, Danny Silva. You guys uh, had this document early on. Uh, I, I think James had contacted me and said you had it. And I said, okay, tell, tell Danny this, you know, this thing about, well, you know, if you guys are dealing with these guys, uh, if you go public, uh, they're going to stop talking to you. And so give, give me the story because all you guys were working on this, you and Chris and uh, uh, Giuliano, I know, contacted him. He didn't say anything. He knew I, I had had the document. He just said, I'm working on an investigation. And so all you guys start working. Can you tell me your situation at this time when, when you first saw the document and what you guys were doing? Sure. You know, we just um, were friends and we're all talking to each other, you know, on a regular basis. <clears throat> One day Giuliano says, hey, this popped up on Reddit. And uh, he was extremely excited, to say the least. Um, he knew the history of it. I didn't know too much of the history of it. I knew that you, Grant, were talking about a document, you know, over the past six months to a year. I didn't know what document it was. Um, so we all had it. 
um, in that little chat. And basically we all kind of, I started freaking out when everyone else was getting so excited. I started to get really excited. I started to put everything I had behind it as far as contacting everyone I know and any sources that I was able to talk to. Um, and I was kind of starting from scratch at that point. Um, the, uh, 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 everyone I started contacting, probably 90% of these people that I really, really trust, they were all telling me it was a real, real deal. So I found out pretty qu quickly that it wasn't fake, as, at least for as far as testimony. I don't have, you know, 100% proof of it, but testimony from people that I really trust were telling me it was real. Um, so then after I, we came to that realization, um, I think also I had sent it to James Iandoli. I had asked him about it and he was like, this is Grant's document. And I was like, wow, this is really, you know, amazing then. And um, so we, we kind of figured it was real um, pretty quickly after about 24 to 48 hours. Then the question was, what do we do with it? You know, me and Joe both have our um, websites, our outlets, and we were thinking, should we publish it? What should we do? I was asking people, you know, I trust that's been doing this for a lot longer than me. What am I supposed to do right now? Should I publish it? I don't want to, you know, uh, mess up anybody's situation, especially a legend like Dr. Eric Davis. Um, so then we kind of, we, we got mixed, uh, mixed um, um, recommendations on what we should do. Some people were saying, just drop it. It's already on the internet, just drop it. Other people were saying, you know, maybe you should think about it. Um, we kind of decided to continue to think about it for a while. Um, you know, Eric Davis is a legend. He's done so much for everybody in the community, I think. And um, the fact that it was already on Reddit, we knew that it was going to leak eventually. So it wasn't like a question of if we don't leak it, it's never going to come out. We knew it was going to leak. So we just kind of didn't want to be the bad guy. I didn't necessarily want to be the bad guy. I knew it was going to come out probably. I thought it was going to come out like the next day. We all thought it would come out like really quickly since it was on Reddit. It ended up taking months. Um, but uh, every day we were like, okay, this is the day it's gonna come out and it didn't come out. The next day we'd be like, okay, today is, someone's gonna notice it today for sure. And nobody noticed it. Then um, months passed, the alien autopsy was uploaded by the same user on Reddit that uploaded the Wilson document. So then everyone, and the alien autopsy document was noticed and that was public. Everyone was freaking out about it. Everyone was talking about it. I don't have as much of an opinion on that document as I do on the Muslim document personally, but everyone noticed that. And I was like, oh my gosh. So all they have to do is click on the Reddit user now and they're gonna see the Wilson document. And that still took like a few days to a week and no one noticed it. Um, and everyone was, it was right there. It was like really right there. So uh, eventually someone did click on the Wilson document. They put it on Twitter and then within pretty quickly, um, Mr. Dolan was talking about it. It was out there and it was big. So we kind of decided to hold off on it. Um, just to sum up, we decided to hold off on it. We, uh, we were all thinking it was real due to sources telling us about 90% of everyone was agreeing that we were talking to that it was a real deal. And we just kind of waited and, um, and that's about it. And Joe has really ran with it. I've kind of sat back a little bit and just kind of listened to everyone else and been doing so much uh, great investigative work on it. Um, and and uh, I knew it would be a hot button issue that a lot of people would be arguing about, like all these documents are. But uh, Joe and Richard Dolan and you, Grant, and everyone else has really ran with it. And I'm kind of just, uh, I'm been along for the ride. Good. Well, you've done a good job. What, Joe, step in on, on this and tell us your role in this whole thing. When you first found out about it, what you did. You have to unmute here. Okay. So there. I am unmuted now. Yep, yep, you're ready. Yep. So 97 May, I'm watch, I'm listening to an Art Bell, and I hear Stephen Greer talking about briefing a Joint Chiefs fella, and uh, you know my ears perked up. So I remembered that, but you know there was no follow up afterwards. I remember people, I don't remember if it was online UFO updates, but people were skeptical of that meeting. But I, just something the way he was telling the story, I'm like, okay, this seems like something that really happened, and I forgot about it. And then in 2000, I was in Florida. And my friend Malcolm Hawthorne was doing an interview with some guy. He goes, he goes, I have this guy coming on tonight. His name is Will Miller, and he's in the military. I'm like, I, I don't know who that is. But he goes, yeah, well, he's speaking at he's speaking at MUFON this week, so you should come down to the studio. I'm like, yeah, hey, uh, I'm not going to come down, but I'll watch. So I watched, and uh, apparently I called into the show and asked Will questions, but I forgot because it was so long ago. I recently got a tape, uh, so I became 
became friends with Will and I went back to visit in 2007 after I moved out West and I went with a friend and I didn't talk UFOs because my friend was not into that. So we just hung out with Will, talked about normal stuff. He made his dinner and then 2000s, you know, I stayed in contact with him. I had my own newsletter and he would write, uh, you know, he'd comment on certain things I would post. We'd stay in touch. We were friends and I would share personal stuff from that newsletter. So, and he would comment on that stuff. So 2000, so last year, April, Giuliano says, Hey guys, check this out. So I look at it and I'm like, Wilson, he goes, remember, you remember Greer 1997? I'm like, Oh yeah. So I'm looking at it. Right. So yeah. So we're talking about it. So I write to Eric Davis. I'm like, Eric, and I had become friends with Eric 18, probably like Thanksgiving, 2018, when we were arguing about Bob Lazar, we were going back and forth and I was telling him he shouldn't have an opinion about the Jeremy Corbell documentary until he actually watched it. So then we privately took that privately. I, I wrote an article about Lazar and then the document came out and I'm like, Eric, what's the deal with this? I'm like, I don't want to get you in trouble. And if I remember, he didn't respond. And when he doesn't respond and never gets back to me, I know that means something because he always responds. Usually he responds a lot. So then it, it leaked in June. We talked about it. We're like, just leave it alone. Don't want to hurt him. You know, I don't think if I would have posted, Eric would have not stopped talking to me. That's just not how he is. He would understand that's what I do. He goes, you know, I, I get information out and I highly doubt he would have stopped talking to me. So June comes, it leaks. I'm like, I write to him. I'm like, hey, I'm writing about this just so you know nothing. I go, can I get a comment? And he goes, no comment. So I'm like, okay, that's, that means something to me. So then, you know, I, I didn't do a ton of research on it until this year. And I've taught, and I taught you know, in my head, I'm like, and I told the guys, I'm like, I do want to write about it guys. I think I'm going to write about it. I'm going to write about it. And then a week, a week would go by. I'm like, I'm not going to write about it. And then a month later, I'm like, I'm going to write about it. I'm like, Nope, I'm not going to write about it. Then this April, I'm like, that's it. I'm going to write about it. I don't remember what the point, what happened. I'm like, I'm going to write. So I just started doing it and then it just picked up and I had so much stuff and I started getting sources and information. And throughout the entire time, I was like, it's real. It's not real. It's real. It's not real. Wilson. Oh, look at him. Wilson comments. He's, what that guy's a great liar. There's no way is this real. So I kept doing that until probably the last week when I, when I, before I published, I still had those doubts. I'm just trying to think everything over in my head. And then finally certain sources are telling me this and I'm like, you know what? Yeah. It's real. And then probably like four days ago, just more information came in 100% real. And I published, I stayed up just as much. I wanted to beat any other media outlets that were going to do this story. I wanted to beat that. So I just stayed up and stayed up and just finished it. And I'm happy with what I had. I've, I've never really, I've never, never really done anything like that where I'm just really proud of what I've done. And kind of, you'll rare, rarely hear me compliment my own stuff. I'm just not like that, but that I am really happy with that. And I'm proud of what I did. And that's where I am right now. Beautiful. May uh, I just I, add something? Yeah, go ahead. I, I just I just want to add um, what Joe wrote is about I think twenty four twenty five thousand words in four parts. It's at ufojoe.com. I think that's your site. Dot net. Dot net. Dot net. Ufojoe.net. And um, I will just say I thought it was an outstanding piece of uh, narrative and analysis, and you really do a fantastic job of of bringing out not just the, the story of the Davis notes on of his meeting with Admiral Wilson, but your personal connection to Dr. Davis and to uh, Commander Will Miller, who's really a key player. I thought it was a really valuable contribution. Glad you wrote thank, it. Thank you, Richard. And yeah, it's really weird to me that I became, I mean, Eric Davis is, is one of my closest friends. I consider him a close friend. And Will, I haven't spoken to in a long time. And last year when I saw that, you know, somebody had gotten a hold of him and, and spoken to him and I wanted to reach out and you know what? I hadn't spoken to him in four years or communicated. So I felt bad. I'm like, now I'm going to reach out now that he's in the spotlight. So I just waited. And then this year, I finally, right before I put the article out, I'm like, I need to, I need to get in contact with him. I need to add that to the article. So James, I am Dolly helped me connect back with him. And we had a, we had a Skype and it was great. And his first response, I said, Will, I want to, I'm writing about something. He's like, what? I'm like, you know, he's like, what? I'm like, Wilson Davis. He's like, oh, <laughs> so I'm like, can I answer you? Can I ask questions? Can I interview you? Can I record it? He's like, he's like, let me think about that. I go, we can do an email if you want. He goes, all right. So he says, you can ask me two questions. I'm like, two questions. So I start asking my friends, what two questions can I answer him that, you know, what do I need to ask if I only have two questions? 
And then in the end, he goes, you know what? Just ask what you want. I'll, I'll, I'll answer it if I can. I just made a huge list up, cut it down, sent it. And he answered, I think he answered every except everything except two questions about the actual cut and paste part where last year he said it was a cut and paste. So yeah, that's, and, that, and so it's, to me, it's nice coincidence that I'm good friends with him and Eric Davis. Good. Can I bring in uh, Bob McGuire? We were talking here. This is the problem that we were all facing is we know these guys have security clearances. They're high level guys. We know them. You got this document. Uh, are you ready to cut these guys throats? I think you've made a comment on uh, the, the situation on the other side, what, what these guys face. I think you had an interview with Joe where you talked about there's going to be some, some backlashes. I remember once before with the, the group, we always called them the Avery and Melinda and I will talk about this later. Uh, that I let something slip and they were furious and they talked about intelligence blowback. So can you talk about the thing where these guys are in this thing where uh, I guess they, they, you know, they shouldn't, they shouldn't have, or should have recovered the document or whatever. Well, what's the situation if you're in a situation like uh, the Admiral? Because people have to empathize with, with the situation Eric Davis is in and the, and the Admiral's in. Can you talk about that? You've you spent 30 years in intelligence. And I just want to point out, because I published a book through Richard Dolan, uh, and it dealt with Dr. Eric Walker. Now, you were with the Institute for Defense Analysis, which in the book we described as the top military think tank in the United States, 90% is top secret, 10% is uh, official eyes only. And um, the guy that we were after for eight years was actually Dr. Eric Walker, who was the uh, chairman of the board at the Institute for Defense Analysis. Then he was uh, the, the emeritus and he was there till his death in 1995. And we were chasing him around while you were actually in this high level uh, organization which is like, I guess, the military think tank to the Department of Defense. And what was interesting about it was it's almost the same as, as what's happened now is um, they, they find some high level guy knows about UFOs. So they send Eric Davis to talk to uh, the high level guy. In the 1980s was Dr. Eric Walker, who was the high level guy who everybody knew, knew something. And I remember Bill Moore, uh, who had the Avery said to me, he said, I, I really don't know if I, uh, if I believe Walker's who you say he is, but he says, I'm sending my buddy in there to find out. He said, I'm sending in BJ. And that turned out to be uh, Kit Green from the CIA. And everybody thinks Kit Green knows an awful lot of stuff. And Kit Green, according, if you read Jack Ballet's latest book, uh, Kit Green gets a security clearance to go in there to talk to Walker. And he tells the story. And I heard this story indirectly back then, but they wouldn't tell me. They, they, this is the old deal. It was like, they wouldn't tell me what was going on. I, they were using my sources and stuff. So Kit Green goes in and he says to Walker, uh, almost like the same thing with with uh, Eric Davis going to Will Miller, what's going on. And they're talking about CIA and the Glomar Explorer and CIA days and stuff. And as soon as he brings up the UFO thing, Walker says to him, give me give me two reasons why I should tell you what's going on. And he and then Kit Green says, apparently he didn't like the answers I gave because he basically in the end, he threw him out of the office. He said, I, I don't need to talk to you. You're not the president. Uh, if you've got a letter from the president, I'll talk to you and I'm going to check the letter. And I'm going to make sure it comes from the president. So you have Kit Green going, the same as Eric Davis goes to uh, the Admiral. You have uh, um, Kit Green going in. And the other person that went in was a guy by the name of Hal Putoff. Hal Putoff went to Eric Davis. He, same thing. He realized that, that, that he had some answers. And if you read Jack Ballet's book, Eric, da uh, uh, Eric Walker actually gave him some answers. He was talking about propulsion. And uh, they report what, what he was told. So talk to me a little bit about the intelligence world and and. How, how this works in the intelligence world and and maybe your story of your involvement because you were involved with the admiral and he was actually at the institute for defense analysis as well correct so admiral wilson was not at ida so uh let me give you a little, little just a quick intro i had uh seen the document on reddit and i read a few lines of it and i went ah oh, this has got to be a fake so i really kind of blew it off and didn't think about it and when it came really into my consciousness and I had a complete gestalt of the document was when Richard blew it wide open. And I uh, hold a, a, a lot of interactions on Richard's forum. And so we were interacting and I thought, this is really interesting. And wait a minute, I, I know this guy. Uh, so I went back and looked at my diary and I had gone to a classified conference, which we have a lot of. And at this classified conference, 
I was asked by a friend of mine to take time and go to his office. And in the office, he handed me a piece of paper, which was a ma which it was, was mail that he had printed out to show me. And this was late 2004, or early 2005. And it was uh, Admiral Wilson complaining bitterly about being locked out of some uh, special access programs that had to do with UFOs. And he was really hot. He says, what do you think of this? And I just told him, I don't, I don't have anything to do with this. I don't know anything about this. And I don't, I don't have any advice. I don't know what you're going to do or say or whatever, but I just can't even give you advice because I don't know enough to give you good advice. So that was the end of my involvement with Admiral Wilson and this document uh, until Richard Dolan blew it wide open. Now, I have lots of experience in dealing with special access programs. I've worked for several of the entities in operations that are involved in all these stories. And uh, from about 1991 to 2002, I was gone overseas more than I was at home. So I've been, done a lot, of, a lot of work for the intelligence community. The thing that Admiral Wilson missed and it's crucial, is there are several different types of special access uh, program uh, uh, classifications. Admiral Wilson had rights to see special access programs that were about intelligence. The special access programs involved where corporations and corporate lawyers and all those things were involved are most always research and development contracts, and they are not inside Admiral Wilson's area of responsibility. So he would not have a need to know to do intelligence. He would not have a need to know to do R&D where they're trying to do speculative development, reverse engineering or whatever. He, he simply would have no need to know and they denied him access. And I understand why he'd be upset, but he just did not have access. The thing that happens when people make mistakes and leave documents laying around and things are found is there is a humongous counterintelligence investigation. It's always the case that large scale counterintelligence investigations are done when documents leak, especially if they are about very highly classified programs. Uh, I have no personal knowledge of this, but I can assure you that if enough people got upset, Eric Davis has been put through the meat grinder of a counterintelligence investigation. And the only thing he will ever be allowed to say is, I have no comment. Uh, and uh, outside of that, I inter interviewed with uh, Joe, who thought I had a reasonable story about what was involved here. I wish I had a copy of the letter. I don't have a copy of the letter. Uh, so it's my word that I saw this letter. Uh, but I thought it was interesting. Yes, Richard. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you, um, Bob, <clears throat> what's your what's the assessment of the classified uh, nature of these notes themselves? Because Eric Davis uh, was meeting with Admiral Wilson in 2002. Wilson had left government service, and they, I mean, they seem to be meeting as private citizens, but they're talking about something that's highly classified. So, what is, what would be the status of Davis's notes? in that type of a situation? I think that they are ambivalent. So they don't, they don't mention the actual content of any of these programs. They don't mention the actual content of any classified topic. They are mm -hmm. mentioning the existence of uh, classified projects. Now, the problem comes, unacknowledged special access programs are truly unacknowledged. You sign a non-disclosure agreement when you enter into one of them saying you will deny their very existence. You will never mention them outside of the cleared spaces that are allowed when the special access program is set up as a place allowed to do business on this SAP. And so if they're mentioned outside of there, people are investigated. I suspect that both Wilson and Davis 
have undergone a counterintelligence investigation because Edgar Mitchell leaked this document out. And they probably had been put through the ringer and wish it had never happened. That is my opinion. Not, I don't know any facts whatsoever if that happened, but I can tell you, I have never seen that not happen in 30 something years. Well, I just want to add and uh, to tack on to what you're saying here, in the early 2000s, uh, that group of individuals around Robert Bigelow, so Hal Putoff and Dr. Kit Green and um, a number of their colleagues, I know for a fact that one, uh, and Edgar Mitchell as well, that one particular essay that they were all interested in was written by uh, aviation writer Bill Sweetman from the year 2000 for Jane's International Defense. And uh, that article, which I have a copy of, is, I think inside the Pentagon's, uh, it's, a black, it's an article about Pentagon's black budget special access program structure. And in 2000, there were not many articles like this at all. And um, I was referred to that argument by that group of people. So it was very obvious that they were very impressed by this. And what Sweetman argued in this is, A, special access programs were dominated by private contractors. B, if you are part of one of these uh, SAPs, and, and especially the unacknowledged ones, just as you say, Bob, your job isn't simply to say no comment. Your job is to actively deny. All Often right. no comment's you're, not you're good told, enough. You're told to lie. Right. That is your order. You're told to lie. And just, uh, and then I'll open this up for anyone else, but when we hear of denials by uh, Admiral Wilson recently, uh, that he, he doesn't, he wouldn't know Eric Davis if he met him and he had no knowledge of this and, and so forth. Uh, that, A, that should be kept in mind. And B, I'm personally continually astonished at the credulity of some people who are researching this field who just accept Admiral Wilson's denial at his, at face value. It's as if you're doing an investigation of a crime and everything points to one person, but then you interview that person and they say, oh no, I had nothing to do with it. And your response is, oh, well, thanks very much. I'll, I'll move on in my investigation. Like that's essentially what some of these researchers are doing in my view. Whereas it's very evident that Admiral Wilson has to deny. So I'm just glad he's, you brought that up. He's required by an agreement he signed to actually lie about it if it's an unacknowledged sap of this type. Now, he's not in the unacknowledged sap. So he's right. trying to protect his position. And so given that he's in a new corporation where almost surely he is maintaining his clearances and operate, he doesn't want to lose them. And so the, there will be a big black mark of counterintelligence in his security folder uh, uh, if, if this thing could, does, doesn't tamp down around him. So he's just going to deny and lie about it. And but as we can say- He's never read into those saps ever right. because they denied him access to it because he didn't have a need to know. We can say the same about Dr. Davis and anyone connected to him, presumably. Yep. Now I want to bring in Melinda here for uh, a comment, but, um, we have situations where to the stars, you have definitely it appears somebody inside the government is talking to Tom DeLong, giving him material to put out. Um, you have situations I've dealt with Bill Moore. Uh, Bill Moore was definitely talking to people who are having stuff. Now, whether that's uh, counterintelligence stuff or whatever it is. Uh, Melinda Leslie just came off a conversation this afternoon with uh, Jim Semivan. So what's your opinion? Is there, are there people out there who are trying to manage the story? and trying to uh, make it move in a certain direction? Or, or why would people like, um, whether it's Semivan or uh, somebody showing Richard Dolan a document or something, why, why is this going on? Is, is this approved or is this just mistakes? Bob. Oh, sorry. Can you not hear me? I can hear you, are you talking to me? Yeah, yeah. In terms of like this thing about this, uh, you know, people who are seem to be official spokesmen that, you know, like Melinda can go to Jim Semivan, uh, who's a very high level guy, and he will talk to her. And uh, I'll get Melinda to talk about this long conversation she had with him about the document. So are there people that are authorized? Or is there a UFO disclosure going on? Uh, what, what do you think? Or why are these people talking to Tom DeLong or Melinda Leslie? Okay, so I do not know what the motivations are 
for them to talk to them. But it's pretty clear to me that someone uh, did decide that uh, they would talk to Tom DeLong for whatever reason. He, he claims he went to the Skunk Works and he got ushered in. And my own feelings, my personal opinion of what the reaction would be is the day the WikiLeaks drops hit and he named General William McCaslin in these, in these uh, email to uh, Podesta. That was the day Tom DeLong had all access cut off and he was put in a leper colony. That is a typical reaction. They would go, you blew it and now you're in trouble. You never should have sent any of this in email. Uh, that's my opinion. I don't know that happened, but that would be a very typical reaction is uh, Tom DeLong's been cut off and they, the TTSA is likely to be in something a sequestered or little access, or you got to earn your way back out of the leper colony. Wow. Okay, Melinda, talk about, uh, we're going to do an interview tomorrow, you and I, we're going to talk about what Jim talked to you today. I talked to you earlier before you had the conversation with him. Can you talk about when you got the document and Jim came to you in, in Sedona and you had a long conversation with him and his wife, and then you approached him about the document. Can you tell that story about uh, the 45 minute conversation about this document with Jim sent me that. Oh, you're already muted. Un Grant, Grant, yeah. she's not unmuted, but okay. we can't hear her. Tell her to check the chat, Melinda. I told you, I put some suggestions there how you can fix your audio. Okay. Um, no, but, um, bottom left hand corner, Melinda, you should have a, an up arrow beside the, uh, the microphone that might work if she plugs that in yeah okay that might okay that there you go okay okay for some reason yeah on my computer it likes my headset to be on and, and, and i should mention one more thing before you start you and i both have worked on this avery the group uh for many years for <laughs> probably three decades and I think maybe you and I were the only people that realized when we saw the document, Oak Shannon's name, and we knew who Oak Shannon was. A lot, most people didn't know who this guy was. He was like completely out of left field. Now everybody seems to know who he is, but you and I both picked up on the significance. That was to me, it was definitely the significance of the document when I saw it yeah, was Oak exactly. Shannon's name. It wasn't what was it? Because I never read the document until uh, Jay did this uh, presentation with Mr. X. I had never read the document. I couldn't have cared less. I just saw Oak Shannon's name and Eric Davis's name. And I know that Eric Davis Davis had gave me Oak Shannon's notes from 1985, uh, the working group that you got as well from Ed Hauk. So you and I had that, yeah. but then you start talking to, or Jim Semivan starts talking to you. Okay. Long story how I met Jim Semivan, someone came on my tour who was a mutual friend and ended up introducing us, long story short. Um, we can get more into that tomorrow when I'm with you. I know we're short on time. Um, so yeah, first off, um, like you were just saying, when I first saw the document, I, I first saw it on Reddit, I think electronically, and then when I was given a physical copy and really read through it, the document being, of course, in the Wilson Davis notes. Um, so I right away noticed the name Oak Shannon, like you were just saying, uh, I've been investigating the history of what I call the working group, just for a short name, and their involvement with ufology, et cetera, for, I've been doing that research for 28 years and I do it with my research partner, um, Randy Copang. And so we've been very, very involved in that. I knew when I had been given meeting notes, like you were, meeting minutes, from the original working group meeting in 1985, I was also giving handwritten notes from attendee Jack Hauk, who I was friends with. This is how I got a copy, not that he ever gave to me, but after his passing, a friend of mine, a researcher in the field, got documents given to them. And, um, and we were both friends with Jack and his wife had given this person access to some files. It's a similar story to all this, you know, was, and so someone had access and we were able to go through them, but in there, was these notes about the original meeting of the working group. Well, also some handwritten notes from Jack Houck, who was in attendance at that meeting. And in his handwriting, his writing is the name Oak Shannon. So I knew right away we were talking about the working group and 
what it eventually morphed into with NIDS. And then from NIDS, obviously, to the present day, you go NIDS, BAS, OSAP, ATIP to the stars. So there's a continual thread, long, you know, the short. We'll get more into it tomorrow. But yes, I just came and I was late today from having a two hour, over two hour phone conversation with Jim Semivan. Here's some of the notes, <laughs> which I have to try and type up and make sense of because as you can see, they're extremely scribbled. Um, we were not talking about the Wilson document. We had previously done that. As you just asked me, I'll get into that. But what I was talking about was the SSCI report, the Rubio report. So we were talking all about that. I've been hot onto it. And Jim, the day it broke, he had sent me a personal email with the whole report as an attachment because he wanted me to know about it. And uh, so uh, I ended up over from, you know, a week ago <laughs> for today, having a, a long list of questions I kept adding to. And so today in two and a half hours or, or over two hours, anyways, I went through like 22 questions with him. Um, again, that's for tomorrow. But so one thing I did do, though, in that conversation also today is I, I added some wording that was specifically in reference to the Wilson document, even though I didn't bring it up because we'd had a previous conversation that was the 43 minute long non-denial. But in the, in the thing today, I did make a point to add some wording to get into some of the implications. So let me just first go to, so yes, I knew the history like you did because of the Oak Shannon name. And that's what flagged me right away and got me involved. I realized the connection to the working group right away. Going on, the 43 minute long denial conversation I had uh, with Jim was um, over a year ago, well over a year ago. And, and that conversation, like I said, 43 minutes of giving him every opportunity. I joked with Grant today, you guys, that I had given you know him like 50 attempts, you know, or 50 options to to deny that the meeting took place between Eric and Wilson, or to deny that the notes existed, and he never did. It was a 43-minute long discussion between us basically a non-denial, explaining why he can't comment. And many things matched, Bob, stuff that you were saying. So th those kind of reasons. But it was the fact that th it proved to me these guys were very concerned about the Wilson Davis notes. Very, very concerned. Um, they had circled the wagons. And um, and now I understand because I think the timing is an issue for them with the, S, with the SSCI report and the forming of this new committee. I think the timing is a real issue for them that with, and, and I did ask him, did he know of the article being written with the New York Times? Did he know that was going on? He said, yes, he had heard through connections that that was going on and that they, you know, but again, I think they're very concerned um, because of that. We'll get in more detail tomorrow. But so that's it, 43 minute non-denial, you know, uh, clearly, again, showing their concern, showing that they were, you know, knowledgeable about it and um, and and everything associated, uh, you know, with, with it. Um, uh, let me see, um, I, I brought up, oh yeah, Bob, yes. Okay, so <clears throat> I want to make sure everybody gets the right context. Rubio's uh, document is yes. a proposal to modify the Senate Select Committee of, Intel of Intelligence budget document and directives the Senate writes for the upcoming fiscal year. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an amendment. So now it, it's great, it's fantastic, but let me tell you the process. Rubio puts up the amendment. If the chairman of the committee, uh, who is also a Republican, so that it's likely to get at least a hearing, if the chairman of the committee allows a full vote of the committee, if the committee votes to support, then it will be added to the committee's recommendation to the entire Senate for what the, what the uh, intelligence budget and the intelligence bill for the coming fiscal year should contain. Then it has to be McConnell deciding 
whether or not to allow that to go to the floor as is or de demands that it gets changed or removed, et cetera. There are a lot of pitfalls between the Rubio thing and President Trump's signature. So I just, I, it's a great thing. I can't believe it's happening. I can't believe it's Rubio that's doing it. I just want everyone to be hopeful, but realistic. Yes, and thank you for your clarity there, Bob. Um, I asked Jim about it today and he said, I said, seriously, do you guys think this is going to go through? Now, I had done a lot of internet research to determine that usually these things go through. Usually, by the time the Senate submits this as a proposal, everyone else says, well, they've done their homework, you know, they know it needs to be in there. And so traditionally, this stuff goes through. So I asked Jim, I said, seriously, do you think it's going to go through? He explained in great detail the problems, just as you just did, and why things could get hung up. But it, the bottom line is, Jim Semivan and To The Stars thinks that this will go through as is. Not only do they think it's really going to go through based upon their conversations with the senators and everything, but they think likely, get this, you guys, that it'll be added to, that there's going to be stuff added to it. So that's, I'm quoting him. That's what he said. Well, uh, Melinda? Yes. So just to recap, by the way, uh, thank you for this um, information. But your point is really uh, cogent here that the Wilson Davis notes really came at a bad time for uh, the folks over at TTSA, the, the Bigelow crowd as the Bigelow crew, as I sometimes call them. Uh, and that this really kind of impedes the agenda that they want. This really came out at a bad time for them. Sure. Well, it's, you know, cart way before horse, you know, and, uh, and I keep, I said to Jim, a bridge too far, you know, mm -hmm. so um, it, it is. And, uh, um, I think they're concerned for that reason, um, but I think they feel, according to what Jim said, very sure that this is going to go through, and it's just a first step. You know, again, Grant, we'll get more into it tomorrow, um, and I just don't want to take up too much time now, um, but there you go. You know, a couple just highlight qu quotes from Jim today. I asked him about, because the problem being, and since we'd said that, maybe people aren't going to understand, uh, Richard, why that is. The problem is, and I didn't discuss this with Jim, but just this is what I was thinking. And when I heard uh, the last Saturday's Coast to Coast, you know, uh, with Knapp interviewing both Joe and Danny, okay, so you guys, Knapp said after coming back from a break, isn't this a problem? And I was like, thank God, because I'd been thinking for four days, this is bad timing. And I was so glad that Knapp had said that. I have a full transcript of his quote here of what Knapp was saying and what Danny said immediately afterwards. But I think that, that yes, that this is a problem because it will, um, uh, it, it, it has the possibility, I think, of, of causing that bridge too far where they have to address information ahead of time and that they just um, uh, are concerned that it could be a, you know, a factor for them um, in, in, in this process, okay, you know, in, in this process and getting back to people. Um, so I think that's just a, a, a concern. And uh, um, can I chime I, in a little bit? Sure, sure. Um, I've never talked to Semivan. I have talked to people at, at To The Stars. And um, I just want to give my perspective um, from when I'm talking to people. I, I haven't ever heard them say that they were concerned about it. But that's just who I talk to and my sources. So I just kind of want to throw that in there. Um, I haven't heard any concern over it. And uh, um, but I've never talked to Semivan either. But well, from my sources. Uh, it's it's it doesn't matter yeah well i, I, didn't, I want you to know that. jim didn't say they had a concern about it okay but what what i did ask was i asked jim about the in the ssci doc i said okay let's say they you know they all this goes through if they get the committee the task force and the task force then asks um you know the 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 different branches of the of the intelligence community to talk to each other. That information goes to the DNI, Director of National Intelligence. Okay. 
then the, the DNI overseeing this, okay, and getting everyone to talk together. Well, I asked Jim, at what point does what happens in the SAPs, and we went all into this very long conversation about SAPs and stovepipes and all, the, all those terminologies. Okay, in the stovepipes, it goes up and then, you know, not lateral, okay, and the, the information meaning, okay, and then also with the SAPs and the USAPs. So therefore, could that be a problem? Will these guys come across that and then have their hands slap? Now, between us here in this group, like Admiral Wilson said, now I couldn't say that, but he knew what I meant. And he went on to say, look, the DNI is pushing it, Director of National Intelligence is pushing it. So the DNI is on, on board with it and, uh, and that they have the pull to cause, you know, the, the groups to submit information. And he, he seemed pretty sure that the SAPs cannot like block, okay, as far as the, where the information goes. Now, I also went on and on with him about it, the information going into corporate hands. And I said, if it becomes corporate aerospace technology information, reverse engineering, you know, can they access that? Well, he, he said, yes, they can go through the SAPs that the, the block isn't there. The block could come from corporate entities who maybe don't have to reply. And so we went all into that. Um, but that's, you know, but that's why. So I, I, I got a, a roundabout by purposefully not bringing up Wilson Davis, you know, and talking about just the implications that we know from that. And, and, and we knew that in ufology anyways. The whole point to Wilson Davis is, is it was definitely confirming what we already knew or thought was the process. And, uh, and I think these are, guys are concerned. You got to remember, too, I keep bringing up that these folks knew this back in 2000, and they sat on it you know, from 2000. So they've known this process. And so, you know, they, they know what they're up against. And, um, and so that same process, that's the connection is, could that same process get in the way? I think the obvious answer is yes. And, uh, and, and even Jim said, when it goes you know, into private hands, that's, that's where the disconnect happens, you know? So yeah. anyways, like I said, I've got more notes. Okay. I'm going to type them up, Grant, so I'm ready for you tomorrow. Okay, we'll be doing it. Just be, somebody's asked a question. Can you explain who Jim Semivan is? And then I'm going to go to Michael Hall. We have Michael and Jay who still. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Been... Yeah. So uh, explain who uh, uh, Jim Semivan is before you leave here. He's the director of operations and vice president for To The Stars Academy. He, he's the co-director and founder of it along with Tom. And he was uh, head of covert ops for two years, correct? For CIA? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He he was very, very high level CIA. The, the word through the grapevine, not that he's told me this, is that at one time he was like the third guy. If you have like the director, you know, the, the assistant director and then him, you know. So and I know that he oversaw black budgets. He's made that very clear to me, oversaw black budgets and where money went and was allocated in the process. And he has very serious questions about where the money goes for this stuff. And and that's why I, I'm right. sorry. That's why I kind of, you know, when uh, not to take anything away from Bob, when he says to the stars doesn't have access, I believe they have great access. If you look at uh, who they're dealing with, but that's just my opinion. Um, if you look at their, okay. uh, their stuff. Um, you, uh, one last question, Melinda, because it just popped into my head. For people who sure. don't know, you asked them uh, four times the question, what could I really do to really uh, piss you off? You would never talk to me again. <laughs> what did he answer? Um, <laughs> That's what they're funding. I'm not remembering right now. Um, you know, basically, you know, like even today, there were three things in the conversation that he asked me not to, to share. Okay. So to keep his trust, if, if there's some part, because he knows in talking to me, I'm going to share it. He probably didn't realize I was going to be on, you know, less than an hour with you guys. But, you know, but, um, but if, you know, so those kind of things, uh, certainly about his own personal experience, um, which is well known. He, him and his wife had an abduction together. That's well known. But the details of that, but I can just tell everyone it's a fairly basic abduction account you know yeah. and and that's out there and that's known i mean that was written about in the ford of i guess of one of tom's books you know so um 
Okay, yeah. let's let's go to let's go to Michael. Michael Hall. Uh, when I when I got the document and I sort of freaked out, I uh, immediately figured I needed a lawyer. And so Michael Hall is the disclosure uh, uh, lawyer. And um, I went to him. And as soon as I sent the email, I said, what do you do that stupid thing for? And I wouldn't talk to him for like three weeks. I sort of figured like, oh, that was pretty stupid. Why did I tell him what was going on? And he was waiting. He thought maybe I'd been knocked off or whatever. I don't know what he was thinking, but he was wondering where did I disappear to? And so Michael, tell, tell the story of, of your involvement where I drag you into this thing and what happens there. Yeah, well, I will. And first of all, um, you know, I just want to make a, a general observation here uh, that you've made before, uh, Grant, in the past is that I think we all are all involved in the greatest UFO Super Bowl event of all time. Um, we have been picked to be on the specialty team in the fourth quarter to go up with three seconds to go to kick a field goal to try to win the game. I think this is a huge time for all of us to be involved in this subject that's so timely. So I'm, I'm just honored to be uh, at all involved in this process. But it started for me. Uh, of course, Grant and I have known each other for a while. But uh, uh, on January 2nd, 2018, I get a, an encrypted uh, text message which I've never received before. I, I don't even know how to open up an encrypted text message. And at that point, I'm going, oh, my God, what is it? Do I even want to open it up? Finally, I figured it out. It's from Grant. He says, uh, Michael, I am about ready to drop a major UFO information bomb, and I need to run it by you as the paranormal lawyer. <laughs> That's it. Very cryptic, as Grant does many times. Now I'm going, oh my God, I get right back onto him on the encryption process. And I said, tell me what you need. I'm here anytime. I leave phone messages, emails, voicemails. Literally for nine days, I don't hear a word. I'm thinking this was the last email that he got out before they offed the guy. And what the heck am I supposed to do now? Do I follow up? Do I let it drop? This is... If Grant Cameron says he is about ready to drop a major UFO information uh, document or something, you got to take take notice. So uh, finally, we got to uh, meet um, or talk, and uh, literally that first telephone encrypted telephone conversation that I had with Grant, I could tell his voice was just wavering. His his uh, demeanor was very excited. He was telling me how uh, James Rigney had approached him during the Laughlin conference with a document that he almost blew off at the time. Uh, then when he, he actually saw this document and started reading it, your words to me were, Grant, that uh, your face went ashen when you noticed these names on here and how important this document was. So that was January 2nd of 2018 where uh, actually 2019, I'm sorry. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Uh, you received it in November of 2018 from, from James. But uh, at that point, then we, uh, you and I are trying to figure out, well, how do we vet this document? How do we figure out if there's any mistakes in this document that need to uh, you know, be looked at to point the fact that this thing could be a hoaxed uh, document? And in reality, what happened was, um, at the very beginning, we decided, you know what? Something has got to be done with this document in case something does happen uh, to you, Grant. You are the most important person on the planet at that point, as far as I'm concerned, being my client. Uh, and I needed to figure out, what are we going to do if something happens to this document? So literally, we created this, uh, what I've termed the disclosure trust, which is a whistleblower trust where people can fund documents, um, you know, artifacts, any kind of uh, uh, thing in there that they need to preserve for posterity. Whether they want to preserve it for five years down the road, for on their death, you know, if something happens to them, that kind of thing. It's almost like uh, serves as well as a dead man's trigger that indeed at that point we published the fact that you had a document that was very powerful and important. Uh, and the fact that it was funded into a disclaimer trust, a disclosure trust, sorry, that would uh, be released around the world if something ever happened to you. So that's 
that's one of the good things about having a document like that. Hopefully it helps things go smoothly for a while for the person who has the information. And we were trying to figure out then what to do with it. And of course, uh, there are all sorts. Of, I remember you telling me, Grant, there wasn't a day that went by that you would spend at least two hours trying to figure out if he should do anything or not with the document. It was, you know, weighing upon you. I could tell it was weighing upon your consciousness for a long period of time. Uh, we had even scheduled a couple conferences, myself and yourself, to kind of reveal the document, which we kind of like, you backed off on, obviously, and I, I didn't blame you. I mean, my God, this is like potentially the most earth-shaking document. And Richard, I've got to give you the kudos here of coming out with such an in-depth analysis amazingly right away as soon as this thing was released on uh, Twitter. Uh, because in reality, calling it the uh, smoking gun you know, leak of the century is an understatement in reality if this thing is true. So uh, thank you for all your hard work in that regard. Um, I am just uh, here to uh, serve as a uh, you know, any kind of a, a backup, uh, a, uh, a person that can give whatever advice I possibly can to keep everybody's head above the water and probably give a little perspective of how important all of us are at this point in uh, trying to, one thing I've, I've even seen with the potential New York Times article that might be coming out is it is literally pulled the ufology community together. This is a great example of it right here. I mean, how many times do we get together uh, as a group talking about uh, one subject or a group of subjects uh, in the same light? So I'm I'm really excited to see what's going to happen. Can, can you, you're still uh, open to people giving disclosure stuff. And just for the record, I gave you a bunch of documents that are in the disclosure trust. And then I asked you, like, what happens if you die? Are you taking care of yourself? Because uh, if I die, then this stuff all becomes public. And that's the problem I have is you you have people that you know, but once you're dead, well, then instead of someone coming to Winnipeg to try to find the documents, let's just put the documents out that I've never shown anybody. So you're open to people doing disclosure trusts if they have a situation where they've got to, you know, uh, save something or for protection, you're open to that? Oh, yeah. I, I've got quite a few clients that some of them I can't even disclose that have already done that. And uh, I can imagine that this is going to be a time where there will be folks coming out of the woodwork saying, you know what, uh, it's about time I do something. Uh, I don't want to die with it on my deathbed. Let's get it out there and preserve it for a time that they determine. It's up to them. Uh, five years from now, upon their death, whatever, they get to put it into a trust. And those terms will be carried out by the successor trustee of the uh, trust document. Thank you, Michael. Uh, one one last question, because um, uh, someone has asked me, um, somebody asked me to put a skeptic on. And so I, w I looked around, I figured, well, you know, a lot of it is counterintelligence where they want to manage the story. So they're going to immediately, as a story breaks, they're going to put other people in to tell all sorts of other counter stories to make everybody wonder who's telling the truth or whatever. Uh, but I did actually um, have a chance to talk to Ron Pandolfi, who is rumored to be the guy who runs the weird desk and maybe running this whole operation. And I was asked about a week and a half ago, is there anything you want to ask Ron? And I said, well, no, not really anything. And I thought, well, I might as well ask him about Wilson. Like, what's the deal with Wilson? And so uh, for the people who wanted the skeptic uh, vision uh, version of this uh, story, uh, Ron gave it to me. Uh, he said um, uh, that he had talked to Wilson and that Wilson had um, denied the meeting uh, as written, whatever that meant. And uh, he also was on a, an email list that some people may be on with uh, Jack Sarfati, where people were sort of laughing at Eric Davis, like he is called a liar because Wilson had denied it. And he came out and made his very standard line, which would apply to all of us. He said, um, is uh, Eric Davis a loon, a crook, or worse? And then he said, Are, is everybody else a loon, a crook, or worse? So that's the skeptical version. Uh, nothing happened. It's all made up. Um, it's uh, hell put off in the Scientologists running a scam. And that um, um, the, the, um, it, the, the meeting never took place. And all of us are loons, crooks, or worse. Everybody in the UFO community. So that's the best skeptic there is. There's, there's nobody higher level than that. And so that's the skeptical thing. But you were following a case with me. Uh, John, Ron Pendolfi was sued by uh, 
uh, caveat. Can you just quickly, before we go on, just sort of update me? Do you know how that thing ended up? You know, I, I don't know. That thing seems to be fizzled out at this point. Uh, I haven't heard a lot about uh, uh, Robert Kvyat doing anything lately. Uh, he was quite hot there for a while, uh, getting uh, after them uh, for for some perceived um, fraud, basically, that he was claiming. Uh, but I haven't heard the details. I did get a chance to download the, the complaint that was filed yes. in Superior Court. But other than that, I haven't heard any response, any answer, uh, you know, from, um, from the other side or, uh, or whether there was even a settlement. I, I don't know. Maybe it was a gag order and there was a settlement. Yeah, well, we'll look that up. I mean, that's because uh, it's kind of interesting. What they're trying to do is uh, haul Ron into uh, court to make him testify. Greg, can I jump in and talk about the skepticism? Yep. Um, you know, I, I'm skeptical of what the SAP manager told Wilson. And I think everyone is a little bit. And maybe, I don't know if everyone wants to give their opinion on it or if we have time. But we don't, just because we believe that the meeting happened, we don't know what Wilson was told by the SAP managers was accurate. I mean, they told him there's no abductions and things like that. So I just wanted to point that out. Okay, I can and speak we should... for myself. Uh, go ahead, Richard. Oh, well, when you make your point, but we should get Jay in here who has not had an opportunity. Yeah, okay. to jump in Yeah, yet. let's go yeah. to Jay. Hey, go ahead, Richard. Introduce him and let's go through that because you did a lot of investigating, Jay. <laughs> Jay, you just jump right in. You got a great channel, <laughs> uh, Project Unity, and uh, I hope you get an opportunity to chat a little bit about your interview with the anonymous Mr. X who gave a, a detailed three hour plus interview analysis of those documents. In my opinion, that's probably the best deep dive into those documents that's out there. Thank you so much, Richard, and thanks, Grant, as well. Yeah. And also everyone who's on the panel and everyone listening at home. First off, I just want to say it's, it's past midnight here, so if I sound tired or look tired, I'm really sorry about that. Um, but I'm kind of, I guess, like the newest kid on the block in regards to the coverage of the Admiral Wilson leaks. Um, all of these guys have obviously been doing this for a long time. And uh, as Grant and Richard and a few of the others know, I got involved with this whole this whole subject in terms of the UFO subject, primarily through uh, consciousness and kind of contact and having my own experiences. But uh, along that line, I was doing obviously my nuts and bolts research as well. Came across the Admiral Wilson leaks around the same time that Richard was, you know, making noise about them on his channel. And so I took a keen interest in them from that point. And basically on my channel on Project Unity, I decided that I wanted to do some form of production. And it started off as quite a kind of small scale type idea. I was just going to read through the script, like the, well, read through the entire transcript and basically just give a word for word of what's going on and provide some visual aids and stuff like that. That was the initial idea, which has now evolved into quite an expansive um, idea for a production which is ongoing uh, because the story is you know kind of still unfolding so that's something that's been a, like a kind of ongoing project but in regards to my most recent um i guess production or upload in relation to the admiral wilson leaks it would be what richard had just referred to as my um breakdown of the notes with my colleague mr x and um i really Thank you, Richard, for your kind words in regards to it. And I can't really take too much credit because Mr. Rex is primarily the guy talking in it, but we put it all together. I put the um, script together on the screen so you can basically read through the script as Mr. Rex is breaking down play by play every single element of the documents. And he also includes a lot of names and a lot of details that aren't directly included in, in the documents, but connect things together and mesh it all together in a very nice way. So yeah, I've, I've primarily been involved, I guess, from a production filmmaker perspective. My YouTube channel has quite an array of different topics covered on it, but the Admiral Wilson leaks has been something where by all manner of synchronicities and coincidences, I've been fortunate enough to network with people like Richard and Grant, Michael, James Rigney and, and, and others. And so, yeah, I'm really excited about what this could be for the future. I think this is an extremely profound area of research for the UFO subjects. And really, that's, that's all I've got to say. I'm just very happy to be involved with this and I hope it gets the uh, attention it deserves. I just want to add one thing uh, on your behalf. Oh, I, I see there, Melinda. Um, uh, the mysterious Mr. X. I just want to point out that this is someone that I know 
And I, I think a number of us have spoken at length personally with this gentleman. Uh, I have a lot of high regard for him personally. And I, for my part, completely respect his desire to be anonymous. It doesn't change one iota his uh, very excellent analysis of that document. So um, I would encourage people to check it out over at your- uh, Yeah, budget. thank you for that, Rich. I, I, I did actually want to bring up that point just because a few people, yeah. sorry, uh, if you just mind, I just wanted to quickly just say, because a few people have been saying, is he an insider? Is he some sort of intelligence guy? And I just wanted to kind of on the record clear that up. He's not an intelligence asset or anything like that. He's just a very keen, passionate researcher who's been doing this for a long time. And he just has his own personal reasons for staying anonymous. But sorry, uh, please go on, go on, Brenda. No, I, I, if it's who I think it is, I had contact with him too. And he's, like you said, a very passionate researcher. Yeah. And I just wanted to add and agree with what Richard just said, that I think that interview that you did with him or him his deep dive breakdown is absolutely brilliant. Uh, I think Joe's blog, Joe's on here with us and his blog and your interview or your, you know, or Mr. X's breakdown are both absolute must reads and must listen to's. And, and I'm so much. glad you guys had the document on there because if anyone is new to the Wilson document or the significance of all the various names and programs and whatnot named in it, Mr. X goes through each name, each program. And so it's, if, if someone's new to it, I, I highly recommend you listen to it and you get that, that, that excellent breakdown. I just Thank you very much. And for those who, oh, sorry, go on. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I just want to, uh, one guy who has not gotten enough props here is Danny Silva of the Silva Record. And Danny's here with us. Uh, his work has been really important as well. Also, uh, a couple of people who are not here, Juliana Marinkovic, a uh, colleague of, of uh, I haven't spoken with him, but I very much admire his work. Uh, Chris Wolford, um, as well. A lot of a lot of you folks have been doing fantastic research and uh, publicity on on this and related matters. So I just want to thank all of you guys personally. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, I, I th thank I th you th so much. Yeah, I think people are worried about whether the New York Post or uh, New York Times is going to do an article. I think they, I think they should be maybe more afraid of the the young guns because they are uncovering stuff. Giuliano has another article coming out tomorrow. Uh, you guys have done a lot of stuff. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, you guys are actually getting contact from um, major media people uh, picking your brain. Because I got the call, and I know uh, James got a call, that we're getting phone calls now from major media uh, asking questions. So are you guys in contact? Or are people looking to you as a source for, uh, or taking your stuff seriously, I guess, the media? Me, I, yes. I've talked, to lots of, uh, I've talked to lots of um major media people not about the wilson document well a little bit about the wilson document but uh just in general i've made friends with some uh reporters mainstream reporters and things like that and um i can't thank them enough for taking me seriously or taking the subject seriously and reaching out and saying that they read these blogs you know i've heard people in dc uh, washington dc read the blogs at some points um that they're also on maybe social media and things like that so it, it's a great compliment I, I communicated with somebody at a newspaper because I wanted to know if there was a mainstream outlet doing a story on the documents, what would that process be like from the beginning to publishing? So I reached out and I explained the story and this person has no interest in UFOs whatsoever, but they were willing to listen. And, and for 10 minutes, she just went through the entire process. And at the end, she said, if this story gets published, you can call me back. And I asked her opinion. This is a this is an example. Somebody who has no interest in UFOs. I said, what is your opinion if we find out we have we have an intact UFO in our possession and it's been there for decades? And I, I mentioned I mentioned biological tissues and maybe bodies. And she said, I would be interesting. Uh, I would be interested. I would I would want to read more. Of course, I was expecting a bigger reaction, but that's a for somebody who's not interested in that. That's that's it's a big deal. So I'm really curious. I am gonna I am gonna get back with her if the article comes out. And I really I am curious. And I'm curious how everybody else is gonna respond. People not like us, but regular mainstream folks. James, can I ask James Rigney? Uh, you can you can't say, but have you gotten interest from from your angle? I think that you've mentioned to me there's some people who might be interested or that this is being taken seriously by the major media. 
I just unmute there. Uh, yeah, I was just going to break in and, and make the same comment. Uh, within days of this happening, uh, a, a, a mainstream reporter in Australia from Brisbane contacted me. We had several, um, call them interviews, if you like. He was very interested in this. Um, he put a story together. Uh, it went to, it was going to be published. I, I won't mention his name or his, um, he's still around and he's still working on it. Yeah. Um, it got through his editor. It got through his senior editor. Uh, he contacted me and said they're running this, and at the last minute they pulled it. Um, and he said, look, I don't think there's anything. This is probably within two months of the story breaking. And he said, you know, there's nothing um, there's nothing uh, sinister about this. He said, I just think they're, they're looking at the names. He said, we can't verify things. You're, you're looking at the intelligence agencies and admirals and the Pentagon. He said, we just, he said, I think they just got scared and they wouldn't run the story. But it, it got that close, like literally to within an hour of running. Um, the other one that Grant's referring to, and he, by the way, that chap's still working on the story and he's trying to get it published in, as we speak, in the last week uh, in a different format. I was always also contacted by a, a gentleman um, who spoke, and some of you here know him. Uh, I know he's spoken to you, Grant. Um, he's in touch with uh, Jay, I know. Uh, a very, yeah. very high profile, award winning, um, former 60 Minutes frontman, 60 Minute Australia. Uh, he's written books, he's won all sorts of awards, and he's, trust me, he's been on this story for 12 months. He's putting a book together. Um, it started with a bit of a, a look at the Wilson story. Uh, it's since grown into a, a broader look at the cover-up and, and all sorts of things. And um, he's not secretive about it, but obviously he's still working on it. But, but trust me, when this comes out, this is going to be a very... And by the way, it's not aimed at the UFO community. It's aimed at the mainstream. So you, that's, that's what who you're I'd just like to. I'd just like to mention that, yeah, the, um, the person that James is, is speaking about um, is, is a fascinating person. We speak um, quite regularly, actually. And um, the book that he's planning on writing, I think is going to have some extremely interesting details involved. Um, I know that he's wanting to keep things relatively quiet at the moment. Um, but yeah, um, if, I believe we're speaking about the same person here, and um, he's. Ex I'm, I'm very excited about what he has to oh, bring yes, forward. This is, this is. This could be the UFO book. This could be. Yeah. This could be yeah. It. People still talking about Howard Bloom's book from 1991. When he first contacted me, he asked the question. He said, "Are you aware of of any authors who have actually written books, you know, aimed at the mainstream?" And and I told. I, yeah, I was aware of a couple of them: Nick Cook and Howard Bloom, um, Leslie Keen. But you know, when there's thousands of books, and none of them are, they're all they're all written by UFO people for UFO people. Mm. And he his, his opening when he rang me he's, days after the thing dropped, he said, "Why isn't the media? Can you tell me why the the media isn't all over this? This is a very big story." And that's I, so that's been his take now. He's and he's been working on this for twelve months, twelve hours a day. <laughs> Trust yeah. me. Can, I'll just make a quick comment. I think Richard wants to comment. I talked to the same guy. I was really impressed with this guy. Uh, I've like probably everybody here has had a lot of conversations with various media people doing their 24 hour story where they've, you know, they're doing this and then they're doing the dog story tomorrow or whatever. And when I talked to him, uh, George Knapp always pointed out, people say, why isn't the media doing this? George Knapp always points out it's a very steep learning curve. This is not some story you can do in 24 hours. You need to do an awful lot of work. And I remember he was talking to me and um, this thing about, uh, the unacknowledged stuff and how they got away with it. And I said, well, the guy you should actually talk to is Dick D'Amato. And almost nobody knows who Dick D'Amato is. He was the lawyer on the Senate Appropriations Committee in 1991 that heard about it. And they went to uh, find out you know, where the money was going and what the security was costing. And he basically confirmed that there was a, uh, a dark arm of, that was unelected that had this sort of stuff. And this reporter said to me, yeah, I tried to contact him. Uh, he, he won't talk. And that's the thing. When he, when he knows who Dick D'Amato is, uh, he know, he's, he's gone up that steep learning curve. But people always forget that, that it takes an awful lot of work to get all the players and all this stuff. Even like Stanton Friedman's files. Uh, I was there and they were, they were looking at the files. They were asking me, like, well, what kind of piles should we have? And I said, well, you need one for Phil Class. You need one here. And I'm explaining. They have no idea. And they've got like, you know, four years of work trying to put this stuff together and they have no idea what's going on. People got to realize that the media people, if they have never touched the story, uh, aren't going to touch it, not because they're not interested, but because they, they're not going to be financed for a year to do investigation, or they just don't have time to do all the investigation that it takes to figure out who's who and, and what the whole story is. So where's the U S media, Richard, where's the U S media? 
Where is the U.S. media? Yeah, I'm talking about two Australian guys. Well, well we have Billy Cox. We, Billy Cox was supposed to be on this show today. I invited him. He couldn't make it. But Billy Cox has done, he did his first uh, uh, thing with me in, in the mid-80s. He did a story on Ronald Reagan's alien invasion when he was with Florida Today. Billy Cox has written almost weekly on this subject. And I remember one time he told me my editor sort of tolerates it. Uh, they're, they're really, it's like your wife or your kids or whatever. They're really not interested. But if you want to do it, well, fine, do it. Do it. Uh, but he's been doing stories for like four decades or three decades and really hasn't got the recognition. But other than that, what do you think, Richard? Well, there's the occasional article by Leslie Kane, and uh, she's done some very, very fine work and she's a professional journalist. But no, there's been a real lack. Uh, there's George Knapp over in, in Las Vegas and yeah. there's all too few voices. I just wanted to jump in and um, first of all, agree that I'm, I'm very excited about this particular book project that a number of you have been talking about. Um, I think I might, we can keep going, but I think it would be useful to recap some of the key things that actually support the authenticity of, of this document that we have been talking about. A few things that we have not yet mentioned um, and the implications of why this is so important. So the fact is, what we're, we're not talking about a government document. We're not talking about something that can be obtained through FOIA. It's a, a privately written document. And people might just ask themselves, well, why should I care? It's just two guys talking, two guys in, in civilian life at this point. Uh, why should this matter? Well, it matters if it is true, because it is a, essentially it's a, a mission by a private group of people centered around Robert Bigelow in this case, Dr. Eric Davis being sent to meet with a recently retired government official, a former head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, and um, a man who was high level at the Joint Chiefs at the time in question. And, and it involves the confirmation of not simply of UFOs, but confirmation of the retrieval of what appeared to have been an intact alien craft not made by human hands, not of this world, in the words of this conversation. So that's important. And so the key comes down to, can we confirm it? For my part, I talked earlier on, before Melinda got in here, about how I encountered this document way back in 2006. There's never been a, a shred of doubt in my mind of the authenticity of this document. And I've never given up the person who showed the document to me. But there's a lot of other reasons to support the authenticity of this document. One person we haven't mentioned yet, uh, except in passing is George Knapp, journalist over at KLAS TV in Las Vegas. George is very close to all of the people involved in this, including to Dr. Uh, Dr. Eric Davis. And George just recently made his own statement supporting the authenticity of these notes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very significant. Um, I mentioned Kit Green earlier, formerly Kit Green was a very high level individual within the CIA. Uh, and as I mentioned, I interviewed Kit about a year ago relating primarily to the, the other leaked, major leaked document out of Edgar Mitchell's estate, that is the alien autopsy email thread. And whatever you think about that, is, it, it, that's an irrelevancy. I asked Kit Green, are, is that email thread authentic? The alien autopsy one in this case. Because at the time, if we all remember, there were very, very loud vociferous skeptics saying, that's a hoax, that's not legitimate. And the first question I asked Kit Green is, are those, is that email thread authentic? And his answer was, absolutely, it's authentic. That is a direct quote. Um, and I, I think that's significant because as we all know, that document came out with the Eric Davis notes with uh, his meeting with Admiral Wilson. They came out together. So I just think it's very important to recognize that. And. Uh, I mentioned that Kit Green gave me an off the record comment about that, which I'm not going to, uh, to say here. Uh, the the, the non-denial, no comment that I got right away from Dr. Hal Putoff on those documents, which was itself really, really interesting. I've got that uh, freely listed on my website. If anyone wants to go check out richardolanmembers.com, but his no comment was also a very carefully worded, I would almost say not quite convoluted, but very lawyerly, in its, uh, in its no comment, which I thought was actually a gift to the rest of us. I would also point out the uh, similar no comment that Eric Davis issued 
at around the same time, almost a verbatim, no comment. These were not denials. These are simply no comments. Uh, I would also point out uh, over at Joe Merge's site, UFO Joe, the uh, whole connection with uh, Navy Commander Will Miller. And this is something that's really not fully appreciated as to just how important that is. But the fact that Miller had a genuine relationship with Admiral Thomas Wilson uh, two, at least two years prior to the 1997 meeting. And this is important because it shows Wilson's interest in the UFO subject back then. And that directly contradicts Wilson's uh, subsequent statements that he has had no interest in UFOs. That's absolutely not true. And it also proved that Wilson was not truthful to me when I spoke with him in 2006, when he told me that the only reason he agreed to that meeting was because of the stature of astronaut Edgar Mitchell and why would that man be interested in UFOs? That's not true. That is not why he did the meeting. He did the meeting because he knew Will Miller and they had a prior connection, a personal connection, and that connection included UFOs. And that has to be understood as part of the record. And anyone who denies that at this point is, is just not looking at the facts. So all of these point to the authenticity of these notes by Eric Davis. The fact that Wilson has to deny it, frankly, is irrelevant. And when these, you know, it's one thing to be reasonably skeptical. Reasonably skeptical means you want evidence. You want, you need to have a reason to believe something. But what we're seeing among some people is just a, a, almost uh, embedded in the DNA type of skepticism and knee jerk skepticism, which is not helpful to this conversation. And then the last thing that I would just point out, uh, there's a lot of things that point to the authenticity of these notes, all right? But uh, I would say that the analyses of these that have been done particularly by the anonymous Mr. X over Project Unity, this is a three hour dive. And what you find is these notes are incredibly fruitful for genuine research, all right? I mean, you know, some people have said, oh, well, it, seemed, it reads like a hoax. It reads like a script. It's like, what? Where do you come off saying that when what you have is a, uh, a, a long extended document that, that repays your, the energy you put into investigating it? Like the more energy you put into looking into the details, the more you get out of it. This is not some fantasy. I spoke to one person, I'm not even gonna mention who it was, who said, well, I think the document's legit, but I don't think Davis was telling the truth. And I just thought, what are you smoking? Because how can you come up with that, uh, that conclusion when you're going to assume that Davis is just making up a story for his colleagues? Like that's absolutely absurd. That's a ridiculous thing to think of. And the, the similarly, the, some of these skeptics who are out there who are positing this as a hoax, none of them have even bothered to speculate who authored the so-called hoax. And none of them have bothered to speculate how someone like myself was able to see that document as early as 2006, unless they just want to accuse me of lying. But Grant, as you pointed out, I mentioned this in my interview with Jimmy Church in December of 2019, and I had no, uh, excuse me, 2018, and I had no clue that this was circulating at that time, none at all. Um, I didn't see that. I'd also like to just quickly jump in and add yeah, that, um, as well as the breakdown of the Admiral Wilson leaks that me and Mr. X did, um, in regards to just kind of certain theories that have been circulating, we have also addressed that. So if people wanted to check out um, a rebuttal to some of the theories that have been circulating regarding the illegitimacy of the documents, then by all means, swing by on the channel and have a look at that as well. Right. Melinda? I'll, I'll add, thank you, guys. I'll add to that, that James, in the beginning of, of um, that very uh, interview with Mr. X, they show the clip of Edgar Mitchell saying that they received information back once, once it had been looked into. So he was saying, yes, the original thing with Greer and everybody happened, but then the Admiral went and looked into it and we received the information back after he looked into it. And that's really important. That's on TV, yeah. Edgar exactly. Mitchell in his exactly. own words. So I'm so, that was brilliant for you guys to put that in the beginning. <laughs> Thank you. Thank I had you. to watch it like 10 times over to make <laughs> sure I grabbed every little nuance, you know? And I think it's important 
Richard, you just touched upon this, but I think it's worth emphasizing over and over again. The only person so far involved with this story who has said no meeting took place and those notes aren't real is Wilson. Everybody else, you know, there's been no denials from anyone else. Okay. Exactly. So, and that that I think is is really, really significant. They've all been not all, but you know, different ones of us on this today have all talked to people involved, giving them the opportunity to deny it. And am I wrong? Right? None of us have gotten a denial from those people. No, no, other than Wilson. Other Wait, than Wilson. Wilson, Wilson actually didn't deny that the April 1997 meeting took place with Greer and Mitchell and uh, Will Miller. But of course, he has denied anything after that. So he denied yeah. spending two hours with Will Miller after the meeting. He denied talking about MJ-12 and his whole investigation into, um, into the programs. And I want to also add, Richard, to what you said about why it's important. In addition to things you said, I was thinking the things that you weren't bringing up, which is which is, again, if it's correct, okay, you know, if everything in it's correct, that there's a reverse engineering program, that it went into private hands, right. Right. that it's managed by private corporation, that NIDS has known this since back then, don't ever forget that, that there's crash retrievals, and, and I'm glad you brought up the other documents, because no one talks about the additional document that came out with these, which was on NIDS letterhead, that there was a meeting coming up for the Science Advisory Board on right. abductions. Then even though Wilson says- Grant in this, put that out. Yeah. Even right. though Wilson says in this, no abductions, okay? But he's just told that. So uh, James, I think, brought that up, or Danny, maybe you did. <laughs> Danny did. That, yeah. that, that doesn't matter. It's like uh, he could be told that doesn't mean it's so. But that NIDS had an interest in abductions. The working group did from day one. That goes back to their original meeting minutes from 85, that they had an interest in it. It's, it was one, it, they had two reasons for existence. One was the technology. The other was abductions, you know, and that was what their yeah. interests were. And that gets into that other letter that says, here's the science advisory board having a meeting just on abductions that all their different abduction research projects going on with NIDS are going to be talked about at the time. I just think don't let that get lost in the shuffle here. That document is also really important because it shows that they had a concerted interest in abductions and, and, and why they did. So, um, Anyways, that's it. I just wanted to add all that. Uh, I, I think there's just so much overwhelming evidence in support of this. We know the history of the Wilson Davis, you know, interview notes and and how they came about, and uh, and and you know when Mitchell on TV, like I said, said that uh, that they got a response afterwards. Boom, there you go. So I, I think it's just, I think it's all there and anyone who bothers to look into the entire history and get all the various pieces of the puzzle will, will come to the same conclusions that all of us on, on this uh, show today have, that this is absolutely real and extremely important. And I can tell you unequivocally to the stars is finding this important to them too. Even though they're not saying it, it's, it's in the way they've handled it shows that they're interested. And they I can't to jump on, but Michael Hall wanted to, uh, to add something it looks like. Michael? Oh, thank, thank you, Richard. Uh, I just wanted to mention the, the one weird, weird glitch in this document is on the very last page that Melinda is alluding to. It's the uh, page 15 where uh, Jacques Gansler is talking with um, Admiral Willen, uh, Miller in Admiral Wilson, I'm sorry, in the Pentagon themselves. And he says, uh, eventually, yeah, you know, UFOs exist, but uh, alien abductions do not exist. I, I can see what's going on there, I think. In reality, you can see how mad Wilson was. Going back to the Pentagon, talking to his buddies at the senior, uh, you know, USAP oversight committee and complaining about not having access. The word is out that he knows what's going on. And I can see this as a movie playing out in my mind. I always thought that Tom Hanks is going to be Admiral Wilson in this film one day. Uh, and obviously you've got, you know, various characters. But Jacques Gansler, I think, was sent to Wilson to say, hey, listen, you got to talk to your buddy. you got to tell him to back off. He's going to lose some stars. He's going to lose his pension and all those, you know, retirement things that he wants if he keeps doing this. 
Uh, but here's the deal. If he goes rogue and, and throws all that aside, we want you to tell him that alien abductions don't uh, happen because we want to muddy the waters here. If he comes out and tries to go rogue and says, yeah, you know, all this stuff's going on, but alien abductions don't, no one's going to believe the guy. It's almost like a counter espionage ploy at the last minute. That's my thought. Yeah. I think it's a good point. That? Oh, someone, go yeah, on. Just, I just want to add that as far as intact craft, you know, Miller, when I asked him that question, he said he thinks various countries have pieces of a craft and he believes the United States has an intact craft. And as far as Gensler, I, I personally think they're downplaying anything negative. Right now, extraterrestrials, fine. Anything that goes darker than that, that is why TTSA had a plan. That story, if, uh, if, if my opinion and my thesis is right, it's pretty dark. And I think TTSA is going to take, you know, they had a plan to go slowly about that. Now that we have this camp come out and we have crash retrievals, I think everything has just sped up exponentially. And I think a lot of people are worried about that in our growth. Grant, you're you're all muted. Sorry. Grant and Richard, so sorry. sorry. I <laughs> muted my mic. Uh, look good though. Thank you. Oh, your dog. Yeah. Uh, I just want I, to mention. Uh, Go ahead. Oh, Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, my account in chat, there's someone in the chat name who goes by my account, and this is a very, very key uh, statement, who added something that I think many of us here talking know about, but a lot of people listening may not be aware. He said, we also know from Greer and Miller, that is Commander Will Miller, that they were told by someone on Admiral Wilson's staff that they were aware of MJ-12 and were told that the joint staff had no need to know. And... Um, that's in the, um, I think that's in the, that's the notes, but it's specifically mentioned by Stephen Greer and Will Miller at various points in um, interviews that they have, and those are on, on YouTube. Um, and I just wanna mention again, like this, this uh, interview, uh, Joe Mergia really broke this with, with his interview with Rob, Bob McGuire, but it's very significant that Bob is here with us to talk about his own interaction uh, back in 2004 to 2005 with the email or with the letter rather that he was shown that uh, talked about Admiral Thomas Wilson's frustration with being denied access to the program. And uh, Bob, is it, am I right in remembering, he mentioned um, Dr. Davis specifically by name in that letter. Am I getting in, that right? In, in the mail. In the mail. So, so he, he had, had talked to Dr. Davis and had tried to find these uh, saps and could not gain right. access. That's really significant. And, and skeptics, again, are going to, you know, if they're insistent on disbelieving everything, they'll disbelieve that. They'll say, well, you don't have any proof, which you don't. But I would just say this is another bit of relevant testimony from someone who is close to the source. And I'm, I, for one, am very grateful and glad that you came out to say what you did. So we've got really, really significant uh, discussion that is here and, and there's just so much more. I, I mean, how far do we want to keep going here? How much, how much more do we want to bring up? There's all of the statements. Joe really uh, in his four part piece and also I think Giuliano in his chronology if I'm not mistaken, but Joe particularly, I remember you mentioning the chronology of the statements by Stephen Greer about all of this and how he actually outed uh, Wilson as early as uh, September 12, 2001. Isn't that right, Joe? September 12, 2001. In a speech in Portland. Yeah, and I didn't even know about, I didn't find out about that until recently when I started digging and looking. And then he brought it up in his book, which was 2004, Six. I think. I think 2006, I believe. Six, and like a lot of people, a lot, Greer has a lot of detractors and I am, I have my issues, but that is a big deal for him. First of all, to bring it up in 97 and then to, to bring it up and out him in, in 2000, 2001. But he says, if you believe him, he says, Wilson told him, if you could find people to go on the record and talk about this, you have my permission to go to the media. And if, if that's true, then he didn't really, well, he didn't say you could name me, but he said you could find the people and Greer obviously had not found those people and he got frustrated and he named him. So 
for us, that's a big deal. And, you know, I, obviously it would, nothing would have happened if Edgar Mitchell hadn't passed away, as you said, but Greer, yeah, Greer has a really big role here. And Miller, like you said, Miller is under, his role is so undervalued. And I think yeah. if somebody does a mainstream article, I, I'm pretty sure Miller will, will be part of that. I'm I'm a hundred percent sure. I'll tell you that without saying it, well, I know it. I think I can, I'll just, uh, jump out and, and give the basic scenario and, and anyone just uh, provide their own different take if they disagree. But basically you had, and Melinda pointed this out, you've got a core group of people going back to the 1980s. They used to be known as the aviary. Bill Moore had that nickname for them because when he's talking with Jamie Chandray on the phone, he didn't want to use anyone's name. So he gave them bird names. They were collectively the aviary. A lot of these people then associated in the 1990s with Bob Bigelow who created the National Institute for Discovery Science, NIDS. And what you find is this is a group of people, Kit Green, Hal Puthoff, Colm Kelleher was part of it. Eric Davis became part of it. Uh, and other, uh, Edgar Mitchell was part of this. Uh, all through NIDS and what you find is a group of very, very smart individuals with various types of security clearances who are clearly trying to get to the center of the labyrinth. They're trying to get to the Holy Grail. They have some knowledge of UFO. They have some knowledge of ET and they want more. And you can just see this all through the 1990s. They're communicating with, with each other privately. They share what they can share, what they can trust each other to, to take. And, and they're kind of, they're, they're a powerful sort of private group with, with classified clearances and they work together. And it, you know, they, they had the discussion on the alien autopsy video back in 2001, that got out. And in 2002, they sent Eric Davis on this mission to meet with the just retired Admiral Thomas Wilson, because there was an opportunity. Oak Shannon was able apparently to arrange that. He spoke on behalf of Davis. He knew Wilson. They all had this interest in UFOs and Davis was able to get that meeting because he had the bona fides and he had the trust. And that's what happened. And all of those notes were never supposed to go farther than that group. But Edgar Mitchell died and those notes, thankfully to someone connected with James Rigney who told that story about how it came out, those notes eventually made it out and then the, the rest was history. But that's, that's what happened. And I just wanna mention one more statement in the chat from uh, my account who is a, a very perceptive uh, person. And, he's, and he just said, also please mention the NRO document that lists Madge Ops and Maggi Ops that Greer sent to Admiral Wilson. And it's true, that was through the an NRO document connection with the code words, uh, code numbers rather, that got, got this whole thing started. And that's significant. And no one really ever talks about the NRO in connection to this, but they're clearly the, very, very, very important in all of this. So. Any other Shout comments? out to my account, by the way, who's a subscriber. Thanks for being here. Great. Uh, can I can I make a comment um, regarding the the thing about the legitimacy of the document? I pointed out, and I think other people now know that Miller and Greer had an extensive interview. I believe it was 2013, where they basically talked about everything. The mm -hmm. fact that Wilson had gone out there and tried to get all this kind of stuff. And Wilson was very open. Now he's sort of more cautious about what he remembers, what he doesn't remember. Uh, they, they were completely open about what was going on. And I believe as Giuliano has got this article that's coming out uh, tomorrow, maybe Joe's gonna be publishing it, but in there, um, Giuliano basically goes through all the comments that uh, Edgar Mitchell made, and uh, uh, just to paraphrase, the the opening line is, I think Wilson's just gone to the other side or something. Or he's it's on there the now, enemy. Grant. It's on there right now. So if people want to see, it's ufojoe.net, and there's email email exchanges between David Haith and Edgar Mitchell. I forget who else had exchanges with them, and it's it's so clear. Unless you're going to say that Edgar Mitchell was lying back in 2008, or these are fake emails, that tells you right. This just that. Just that exchange alone is enough and we have so much more. Yeah, and so that's, a, that, and it shows you the extent that uh, uh, mm -hmm. Giuliano goes to, to do the research. This guy's absolutely incredible. I mean, it would take you, he's got video links, audio links. He's got basically, I mean, I used to go to this guy when I did Magic Magic, I said, 
uh, I'm looking for all the uh, Tom DeLong early interviews. And it's like within a couple of hours, all the interviews are in my email box. I mean, this guy's just, he has everything he cataloged. And the other thing that people haven't brought up is, is everybody knows Eric Davis. I mean, probably everybody's dealt with Eric Davis. And if Eric Davis uh, had not done these notes, mm -hmm. He would have gone a. I mean, he would have gone nuts. I mean, he, he he's not going to sit there and say no comment. Uh, we, he when he went after Bob Lazar, he basically said it was a fraud. He was he he doesn't uh, mince words. And the fact that he is doing a no no comment is uh, pretty uh, uh, pretty significant. And also uh, re relating to Dr. Davis, we got to give a, a real shout out to James Andoli again, because James also communicates a lot with De with Eric Davis and. You know, just about a week or so before the whole Wilson Davis document came out and blew up ufology, uh, Lou Elizondo was on Tucker Carlson uh, on May 31st of 2019. And that was for uh, publicity for the upcoming show, um, Unidentified for, you know, TTSA show there. And um, it was a really interesting interview. You gotta give Carlson credit for, for conducting a really excellent for a mainstream media interview, this is really outstanding. And toward the end, Carlson asks Elizondo, like out of the blue, does the US government have in his possession one of these, uh, he said, I think he said aircraft, but he meant these UFOs. And Elizondo paused, I think a lot of folks remember, this is on YouTube, you can find it. And he uh, originally said, well, my, my NDAs prevent me from, uh, uh, getting into this so I can't and Carlson was ready to back off but Elizondo then ended it he said but uh, simply put yes U.S. government has it and that was the end of the interview so Ian Dole was watching this and he immediately wrote to Eric Davis to get a comment on this like what do you think about this and and I have I have Davis's reply and and James said to me that this was a very carefully edited reply and the, the reply was, Luis Elizondo's very brief answer to Tucker Carlson's question about whether the US government is in possession of recovered, crashed, and landed UFO technology hardware is 1000% accurate. My national security NDAs prevent me from adding any further comment on this. That's really significant because first of all, uh, as James pointed out to me, uh, Dr. Davis added recovered and landed, not just crashed. That's significant because that when you see that that actually refers directly to the comments within his notes from Admiral Wilson, where they're talking about an intact craft that, you know, progress was, was painstakingly slow to kind of understand and reverse engineer it, but it was an intact craft. And that's apparently what Wilson had been told. So it's, it's not much of a stretch to see that this is what Eric Davis was actually referring to. And again, this is one week before the notes came out that would change everything. So I just think that's a very significant uh, additional piece of context that again points to the authenticity of these. Of just these one notes. second, this points out something to me. Um, uh, the carefully worded single three letter word says to me that mm -hmm. whoever the original security officer was in dealing with the special access programs where these materials are housed, stored and studied was not careful and the thing that is uh, not prohibited is saying these things exist. What has been prohibited by the special access program security guidelines are discussion of the ongoing activities. And you've heard Davis and put off and others say, and I think it's very suggestive that we are not allowed to comment on ongoing government activities. That to me is the klaxon bell being rung so to tell us they can't talk about that. But Elizondo saying yes, and Davis saying yes, means it's a loophole in the security guidelines that yes, they exist. That's and a really good insight. Richard, Richard, you just, you just, I think you just solved something. I always wondered why did Luis Elizondo all of a sudden out of the blue admit that we have a craft, you know, or, or pieces of uh, debris from a UFO. It was just out of the blue. He knew that he must have known those documents were online. He must have known. 
Well, I would I would bet that uh, because Elizondo, you know, got essentially brought into the same crowd. So he obviously knew, uh, even, even though Eric Davis is not formally part of TTSA, I mean, you could almost consider him at least initially an honorary. Right. He's very close with Hal Puthoff, who's in there. So it's possible that you're right. My assumption, and it's, I'm only assuming here, is that he learned through his association with Bigelow um, or his association with people connected to Bigelow, like Puthoff and, and maybe the others. But I don't really know. It's an interesting Can thing. I chime in? I'd like to chime in a little bit. Um, everyone agrees there's debris that, I, that I've talked to, and <clears throat> it seems like even sources that don't like each other, everyone agrees there's debris. The big question is, is there an intact craft? Um, I've gotten comments that there isn't from very reliable people, and then I've gotten comments that there is. So I don't know. I, I think that's more of a wash, and that's more up in the air. But the debris, I think we could take to the bank at this point. I could, I could tell you one thing I've never, never said before, and I don't think I'm giving confidence. I, have, I asked Eric Davis that. I specifically said, do we have intact craft? The answer was silence. Make of that what you will. He's not a person that is silent with me very often. Well, I, I would say if you look into the history of US uh, recoveries of, uh, of UFOs, you've got the Aztec crash in 48 and you've got the Kingman crash in 53. And as far as it appears to me, when you look into the, the testimony that exists, those were both fundamentally intact craft, particularly Kingman, but also for the most part, Aztec. Well, additional, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Additional, in my conversation with Jim today, we got into that to the stars and the members. And, and remember, Jim has always told me when he brings up to the stars that the public face and the what everyone sees the public you know face and on their website is represents a much bigger group that they're actually like 40, 50 people. He's made that clear repeatedly to me. So no, it's a bigger group, but he said, they they know that the they they know there's craft they know there's crashes there's retrievals there's debris there's bodies there were living bodies he said we know all that as a group so they they, they don't don't ever second guess them they know that that stuff exists okay but it's a bridge too far with going in the SSCI report to say you know we're going to go there let's start with what do the agencies know in their documentation and their intelligence and blah 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 so but the but do they know and do they want to push this all the way into that area eventually yes jim said we're going to keep on these guys even if this goes through and there's a report i said are you guys done you've done talking to the senators you've had your closed door meetings nothing else is going to happen and he said we're going to keep on it. We're going to go after the gray hairs repeatedly. I'm quoting him there, you know, but he said, we're going to, we, what was the actual line? I'll find it in a minute. Yeah. Keep up the pressure with on the gray hairs is he said, he said, so he said, we're not going to let it go. We're, we're going to push it till it goes there. This is step one. They're willing to talk about it. What they start finding will lead to the other steps as long as it, you know, as long as it all goes through. So he said, we're, no, we're not done. There's going to be more briefings. And we're going to keep going. So I, uh, I want to tack on here when when we're talking about like how much these these gentlemen know, we're talking about the TTSA crowd that and formerly the Bigelow crowd and, and all of them. Uh, I mean, there are some folks who will say, well, they should just tell everything they know and come out with it. And I I have I have personally begged a couple of them to do that, but the, the fact is they they won't. And but in a larger sense, you can almost say maybe they can't. And what I mean is. Do they really have the goods? Like, are these guys actually at the center of all the information? And I'm going to take a guess that they're not. I think they're knocking at the door. Maybe in some cases, they're, some of them are pretty close. But no, I don't think that they've, they have actually all the access. And could they prove it? That's another thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one thing for some of these folks to go on the record and say, yep, I'm quite sure this is true. <clears throat> Edgar Mitchell told me personally back in 2004, all right, that he knew for a fact this was real, that there were there was programs to study alien tech and alien bodies. Edgar Mitchell told me in a closed door room, him and me alone, back in 2004, we were in Roswell, New Mexico, doing a conference there, and that's what he said to me. But could he could he prove it? Sure, surely not. And and could any of these other people prove it sufficiently so that they could withstand? an absolutely bl blistering, withering media firestorm that would probably be directed against them. 
And would it be worth it? And, and as Bob was talking about, are they gonna like blow uh, security clearances and, and federal law potentially? Yeah. No way, there, exactly. there's too much of a risk and they, they wouldn't necessarily be able to prove it. Yeah, I think you said that exactly. to me once, Richard, you had talked to somebody and they said, you asked, can you identify the top guys? And he said, yeah, probably, but you'd go to the New York Times, I'd have to deny it. Exactly. And, no, and nobody would ever talk to me again. And people got, that's what I said. That's why right. you have the problem that these guys are trying to protect. They've got kids and they've got families and jobs and stuff like that. And it's just one little leak. And that's the end of your career. Edgar Mitchell told me I was this is back in 06 and I was. I actually, I think I almost said exactly, will you please throw me a bone? I was, I was looking into a lot of this and I said, look, you tell me you like what I do, just throw me a bone, point me in a direction. You said that you had two people who told you explicitly of these types of programs. Can you give me anything? And he said, no, I can't. And this is exactly what he said. The people who told me what they did, did so at great risk professionally, personally, and risk to their families. And he said, as long as they're alive, I, I'm not going to throw them under the bus. Well, that's that's exactly that's exactly what. Um, whoops, whoops, get turn that off. That's exactly what um, was said to me by Jim in that 43 minute long non denial was. Look, you know, the, this involves people we know. It involves their their projects and their plans and their and their and their uh, careers, and uh, and and their careers, uh, you know, at state and their family well being. And he said, you know, not only is our NDAs and we can't discuss it, but additionally, we're protecting those folks. And he made that very clear in those 43 minutes. One, one really, really important thing that Will Miller said in my interview, and he said it in 2000 to my friend Malcolm, he said, if a program was created illegally and it doesn't have any oversight, he believes the people in the program can speak out about it with no legal repercussions. Keep that in mind when, when the mainstream article comes out and Will Miller is in that article. Bob, can I ask you about that? Do you think these programs are illegal? Uh, so it's, it is completely legal to have an unacknowledged special access program and run it through corporations. Uh, Wilson, Wilson thought that he had control over them because of his position, and he was thinking that it was an intelligence sap, but it wasn't an intelligence sap. It was a research and development sap. They're different. So uh, yeah. could I could I chime uh, in real quick just to say just really quickly just to say something and it might be just a slight um, uh, mis mistype in in the documents but I think he was suggesting that these were actually beyond even unacknowledged or waived or carved out special access right. programs that they were hiding in a different sort of section so I don't know if it's like slightly beyond even the most ridiculous levels of security or if that's just a, a slight typo. Oh, no, you're right. right. Well, that's what I'm asking Bob. Like he he would know better than anybody here. Because that when when Melinda asked me when he she first had your conversation with Jim last year or whenever it was, you asked me what would you like him what would you like to ask him? And the one question I had is, is this constitutional? Is what you guys are doing constitutional, or are you a bunch of rogue guys who have sort of skipped the law? And that's what I want to know. Is this an actual illegal program, like Greer says, and the people can walk out with the documents, or is there a legal way that they are uh, covering this program and it is responsible under the law or is it just a black operation where they're Jim did say on the phone with me today exactly Bob what you were just saying there's fine lines here because if there is something illegal yes Joe if there's something illegal like Will says they you know it, it, then their security oaths don't apply but when it comes to the USAPs and SAPs yes it can be covered and yes it's also covered with shell companies um, so he was telling me all about how that whole process works. And he said exactly what you were just saying, Bob. Yes, you know, they, they can hide it that way. But he said when it comes down to, you know, we talked about a couple of what would be like really illegal things, like what happens to the Millab cases, you know, they were talking, you know, an abduction of a person and, you know, and he said at that level, I mean, just with, we tossed out many examples, not just that, but that's in my own wheelhouse. So there you go, you know, but he, he said, it, then yes, then it wouldn't apply, but that's at, at that, you know, at that deeper point, at that deeper level, but you can cover a lot up until then. So he was explaining how, how that's possible to me. And, uh, 
you know, and 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 so yeah, the, a, a a lot of and he said your your security your oath is always your oath, you know your your security oath your security clearance is always there, and uh, but he said you know those it would apply differently to the corporate entities and. And at that level, that's where the, the disconnect can happen. So I tell you guys, whoever came up with the idea of let's bury this in the corporations as a way to disconnect was, a, I don't know if it happened by circumstance or it was somebody's sheer brilliance, mm -hmm. but it was a brilliant move because that's how they've gotten away with everything. And that's that's the significance of the Wilson Davis notes. We learned, we had it confirmed for Uvalji. We know that's how they do it, but it, it's a real problem. And Jim was saying it could be a problem now with them, you know, looking into, um, the different, you know, uh, stovepipes going on within each different intelligence agency and the connection and getting that information out, because he said if it's at the point that it goes corporate, we don't have access to it, you know, but but the DNI can put the pressure on the um, SAPs and the USAPs because that's all still within the governmental process. Okay. Can I ask it, it Bob sounds... one question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Bob, just from my article, one of my sources who I trust implicitly, uh, he said a DOD office can create a shell company, as, as Melinda just said, and then transfer funds to it under an unremarkable commercial defense systems contract. Then that shell company turns around and gives a subcontract to a third party aerospace defense firm that hosts a waived unacknowledged SAP that operates outside of section 119 of title 10. This usually hides making the audit trail terminate at the shell company, the flow of money going to the third party company that's running a waived unacknowledged SAP where, where a UAP crash retrieval program is hidden. Is that legal? That that's what I'm legal. asking Bob. Bob would have the best answer of anybody. Here. Yeah, that is legal. Says, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Bob says that's legal. What Jim, we can call Jim it says, is- Jim said that was legal. It's legal. It's, it's legal. I will never tell you anything about anything I've done that's like that, but I have done it work in a thing like that. It is- I just want to add- legal. Jim We're basically talking, said the same exact thing, Bob. This is legal illegality. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. when you really, I mean, look, everything that Mao and Hitler and Stalin did, that was technically legal too. I mean, they made the laws and they did whatever the hell they wanted. Mm -hmm. So legal is a, a bit of a little fig leaf that we're putting on over this whole thing. And, you know, we can say, yeah, it's technically legal, but is it really legal? And, you know, well, one of the- um, it, it appears to me that the, this particular one is really unethical because it's, right. it's legal, but unethical or immoral. Right. So there are value that, judgments you can attach to it, but there's a legal construct for doing it. Yeah, right. Let me I ask, let me is, ask oh, Richard sorry, a go question. On. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I think this is a, a really good point just in regards to, uh, to be honest, I've lost my train of thought because I'm, it's about 2 a.m. So don't worry, you just go ahead. I'll, 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 I'll rewind I, I, I wanted to ask, I want to ask Richard a question <laughs> about this Ill illegality. Uh, Richard, if you were in the program, and that's what I've always said, that uh, to me, it always seems like it's got to have some sort of legal background. Otherwise, people would walk. If you were in the program and you would you walk would you take the documents would you put your career and your family on risk and walk out why is nobody walking out or very few people it's easy for for me or anyone here to say oh yeah i would just walk out i would do it but the fact that no one has done it should tell us something like people just don't do that you know we're, we love these days looking back at people in the past saying oh they were wrong to do this or that or that but people in the past did what they did for whatever reasons and here we are now we're in our situation but people in the world of special access programs and the unacknowledged special access programs uh, i can criticize them for not coming forward but i don't live in their world so it, it's yeah. there's a bit of a disingenuous nature for me just to go and say oh yeah you you should do this because i think you should do that uh, having said that, look, I'm never going to stop believing in the United States Constitution and the rule of law. And, and I'm never going to stop believing in the fact that law should have an ethical foundation. And so therefore, there was a very interesting uh, tweet that Tom DeLong put out about a year ago. 
And I wish I could remember it exactly, but it had to do with the fact that, look, he says, you want to change the system. You've got to make fundamental legal changes to the way that this secrecy is managed. And it seemed to me that he was dropping a hint at this whole thing that we're talking about. The fact that these saps and USAPs are buried legally, but unethically within the bowels of a national security apparatus that waves all of this stuff and, and hands it off to shell companies and private corporations and contractors. So no one, no one in the public can really get access to it other than maybe a handful of government officials that you could probably count on the fingers of one hand. Probably. This is the yeah. this and, is the point I wanted to make really quickly, just in regards to yeah. you know legal illegality, because you know we, you know you, we can be pedantic about debating all of the little micro elements of what laws are laws, but it's 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 a, it's a subversion of democracy in all yes. honesty. You know it really is because you can't you can't justify these sub laws over sub laws over you know the, the, this vast infrastructure that has taken place that is completely hidden from people that could potentially be holding on to vital knowledge technologies data acquisition like this is so vital and I, i'm sure that there are some genuine reasons like real genuine reasons why this has been sequestered and kept quiet for such a long time but at the end of the day we are talking about a free you know a free democracy apparently and this is not represent of that melinda go ahead well you guys all know the quote eisenhower leaving office Beware the military industrial complex. And then what and then what came in his talk after that, but he was like unwarranted access and interest. You guys, that's where it's at. It's gotten out of control. And I think that's symbolic of a lot of the problems with with at least the US government right now is corporate control. And so that that affects so much of everything going on in the government and it's getting out of the hands of the people into corporations well guess what that's what happened to this subject too yeah. so and i'm and and jim is telling me the navy's not backing down on the on the ssci and making sure that it happens because the navy knows this got out of their control and they want to know, like when their pilots and Navy personnel are seeing stuff, retrieving things, everything, they, they want to know. They, they want to know where did it go and it got away from them. And I think from what he tells me, it sounds like they're very unhappy this got away from them. Melinda? Yes. What's really interesting here? You know, when we talk about, well, why would the Navy or why would any branch of the government have any motivation for investigating UAP or UFOs now. But, but really the whole stovepiping and uh, squirreling away of all of this information really should tell us that the very likely the fundamental service branches themselves by and large probably don't have as much information as they want. And so it's, it's a kind of a bizarre situation that we're finding now. And, and I think we all realize the United States Navy and other major navies they have a lot of these encounters because there's a lot going on in the oceans of this world. And so maybe, just maybe, they've gotten to the point where there's a, a significant faction within the US Navy that genuinely believes like we've got to get some more information yeah. because it's very likely that they don't have what they need and in terms of in, info on this because it's all gone deep rogue, just as, right. as Greer basically yeah. was saying 25 plus years ago that this is all, or yeah, it's all gone rogue and, and formal government channels don't have enough information about this, right? What do you think? And let's hope this current effort discovers some of that. I mean, you know, that's that's what the to the stars, according, you know, I'm going with what Jim, and I don't want him mm -hmm. to say, I just buy everything he says, hook, line, and sinker. I ask real tough questions, but it sounds like, you know, they're really saying, you know, we know that's going on. We need to, that needs to be found out because there is this disconnect. Like you just said, it went rogue, or like I was saying, it went corporate, you know, and, um, and, and there's, a, there's a disconnect over it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating. You want to wrap up, Richard? Maybe ever can make a final comment, unless there's a con uh, something from the audience. Yeah. Well, I'm actually, I'm personally really satisfied with uh, this type of conversation that we've had. I mean, considering there's so many of us, and we really got a lot of points of view in there, and a lot of data points in there, particularly. I, I think that, you know, we started out uh, almost three hours ago, each of us almost tentatively talking about our little piece. Uh, 
in connection to to the Davis Wilson notes. Um, but I think as we kind of all loosened up, we really started asking some really pertinent questions about this and really diving in and, and looking into the authenticity of these notes, which in my opinion, honestly, anyone with a brain in their head who's, who has a reasonable uh, sense of logic is going to have to conclude that these notes are legit. And I personally think that only the most obstinate, uh, I would say even pig-headed, uh, you know, devoted skeptics of, of, uh, of this are going to maintain that position. I just think that a reasonable analysis shows that this is legitimate. And what that means is um, that it's a, it's a kind of classified leak. It's a quasi-classified leak of something very, very significant. And that, that actually continues to provide a lot of potential for future research because there's a lot of information in that. And, you know, when, you know, investigators are meeting with denial after denial from the, from the parties involved, but, and, and some people are just taking that as, oh, well, that must mean that, that none of this is legit. And, but all of the interesting questions are not being asked by those individuals. So like, if you think that this is a hoax, do you have any idea how these could have been hoaxed and by whom and for what purpose? And that no one's ever come up with a credible reason for that. Uh, and all of the information now we're seeing again and again is uh, more and more individuals are supporting the authenticity of these documents. And that will continue to happen because it's the only direction. And Richard, gonna... if it was a hoax, how come the people involved are not saying that? That's exactly. right. They're not exactly. saying that. <laughs> no, they are not because they don't want to lie. Exactly. Saying I can't comment because it may pertain to currently ongoing programs is not the kind of thing you say if you genuinely know it's fake. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I yeah. mean, Eric Davis would say, I didn't have the meeting. I didn't write that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. idiot. Yeah. You'd say, you idiot. I didn't have the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, Grant, I really want to commend you for organizing this. Uh, you got together a really great group of people and, um, I think we've provided a, a, a good amount of information. There's so much more, but this is this is a good conversation. Oh, thank thanks you, for thank you for letting me participate as well. I really appreciate it. Th thanks to all the guys for the the work they've done, a lot of work. And I know you probably all know they watch everything, so they'll be sitting and analyzing this. And uh, uh, I, I I really am am proud to be a, a part of the team of people that have put this together. So thanks. Can I say one thing? I would not have been able to do my article if it wasn't for Richard and Grant's videos because that's what really started me. I really didn't fully understand those documents till I watched both of your videos. And then the topper was talking to that person you guys mentioned, that top notch guy that we've spoken to. That guy put me, I mean, the conversations we had really gave me a lot of confidence to keep going. So, and I think he's watching right now so thank you to you <laughs> and, and I'll, just, amazing. I'll just like to say i have no idea how i got so lucky to be here but i'm really happy i am but you did an amazing job <laughs> well thank you <laughs> and james thank you for starting everything well, we yes. yes yes james <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> the forgotten man here is the guy who We's trying, we hope one day he'll come out and tell his story because he's got a lot to yeah. talk about. Is the guy who had the presence of mind and the wherewithal to watch Dr. Mitchell's estate being carved up. He had no interest in the UFO stuff, the consciousness stuff, mm -hmm. but he had the presence of mind to say, we need to keep this, this is history. And in conjunction with at least one member of Dr. Mitchell's family that I know of, um, he went to a lot of trouble to salvage that, those documents and store them and uh, I hope one day he comes and tells his story but uh, let's not forget that he is ultimately solely responsible for everything. Absolutely. Yeah. I have a question. Do we know, do any of you guys know who was the uh, person who uploaded the documents to the Reddit uh, feed? Hmm. I, I know who it is, yeah. You do? I'm, I'm pretty sure. I'm 99% sure. It was actually two people. It wasn't one. Okay. One guy was at one guy was in the Pentagon, a friend uh, who had no interest in UFOs. He's the guy that suggested how to do it with the, uh, you know, to hide your identity with the Proton Mail account and the use Reddit. And it was another guy who 
had, as I said, had contacted me and there was, he was being recruited by people inside the UFO field for various things I won't get into. I said he may be going under a non-disclosure agreement. And uh, when he saw the document, he said, leave it with me. When I said, I can't drop it, he said, leave it with me. So I'm pretty sure. And uh, he's the guy that, he's the guy that sent it to you, Richard. I'm pretty sure. Okay. Because I've never figured that out. Yeah, I know. I know who it is. I'm pretty sure I know who it is. You can tell me one day. Yeah. <laughs> you buy me a beer, I'll tell you in confidence. All right, sir. Good. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody. And thanks, everybody, for watching. And uh, let's see where it goes. There's a lot of rumored uh, of new things that are happening. So let's see where it goes. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Grant, Good real job. quick. Grant, tomorrow, what time am I on with you? We can tell people about it. 12 noon, your time. We're going to talk about um, um, your friend, uh, Jim, and we're going to get into uh, what that, he told you today. And, and, and talk a little bit more about the SSCI report, the yeah. Senate report, which I actually covered quite a bit of today, but we'll, we'll okay. uh, give a full story on tomorrow. Okay. I appreciate you, what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye.